in anything else that can be named. You know, if you can put a name on it, Jesus is above it. He's Lord over it. Sickness, poverty, anger, depression, everything, everyone will bow its knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Every knee of men, women, children, angels, demons will bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jews also, my friends. <laughs> Those who have denied his existence will bow down in worship. Those who have spent their lives rebelling against his authority will finally bow down in submission to him. Every creature on the face of this planet will know Christ is king. Every being from all time throughout all history will ultimately bow down and worship Jesus. Why don't you start now? If we bow our knee to his lordship right now, we'll enjoy a better life here on earth and an eternity in his blessings after we leave this earth. We'll have fellowship with God Almighty forever. You know, those who deny his rightful claim to the lordship of their lives will suffer for it in this life as well as the next life. But they'll still have to bow their knee to his authority. So there's nothing to gain and everything to lose if you refuse to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life right now. Right now. Why do you deny him? Why do you not believe what he told us to be true? Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and King. He is God in flesh. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah who was prophesied. And he is coming back. I hope and pray that your heart that your household, that your spirit will be prepared for that. There's coming a moment in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, the sound of the last trumpet, when the ability to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will cease to exist. There will be a door that will be shut forever. If you haven't accepted Christ before that door shuts, you're going to spend eternity in hell. I don't wish that upon my greatest enemies. I hope and pray that you will come to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, Savior, and King, and that you'll get on your knees and repent of your sins and accept him for who he is. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend. Go to church, worship our Lord and Savior, take somebody with you, and good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday. I have two distinguished patriots on the telephone who devoted their entire lives to protecting the American people and the republic. I want to hear their opinions on this surreal state of reality. In September 2014, Major General Paul Valley retired from the U.S. Army as Deputy Commanding General, U.S. Army Pacific in Hawaii. He is the chairman of Stand Up America. The website is StandUpAmericaUS.org. General Valley, welcome to True News. Glad to have you back. Well, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yes, sir. And U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney served his nation in numerous command positions. He retired in 1994 as Assistant Vice Chief of Staff, U.S. Air Force Headquarters in Washington. This is his first time on True News. General McInerney, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me, Rick. Yes, sir. Uh General Valley, I'll start with you. Um, my introduction. This is this is surreal. This is like something from a Tom Clancy novel. What is going on in this country? Well, it does seem surreal. Uh, that's for sure. But certainly, uh, it is real. What is happening? Uh, and if you go back, as Joe McInerney and I've studied, that the whole world changed in 1979. Uh, when Iran took our hostages and the real war began that set off everything in the Middle East. And then, uh, you know, when we settled the Cold War, we had a strong president with a strategy named Ronald Reagan. And uh, that Cold War uh, came to an end in the early, uh, early 90s. And then as Joe McInerney and I visited the Middle East uh, in 2003, uh, we were able to uh, put together uh, a sense or analysis of what was happening over there, and we wrote the book uh, 
end game. And uh, that really was a, uh, a plan on a strategy to defeat uh, terrorism, which now General McInerney uh, likes to use, uh, which is a war against uh, jihad. So uh, in, in that regard, uh, we've had a uh, working relationship for a long time, General McInerney and I have, uh, at Fox together in the early uh, 2000s when we covered uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and have followed uh, since that time all the happenings up through the ISIS uh, situation at this point in time. But uh, I think the, the most noteworthy thing is now that we have a leaderless White House uh, uh, lack of a strategy, probably the most inept national security team we've ever had. And it's a travesty because it, the United States borders, the United States itself, uh, we are constant targets and will be a target soon, uh, as we both uh, predict. And uh, we could see something happening, of course, on this 9-11, which uh, we would like to be very confident that our government was securing the borders in doing so, but I'm not that confident that uh, they have done the necessary job. General McInerney, is Barack Obama inept, incompetent, or is this man brilliant? I I tend to believe he's he's played golf all summer because he's very happy with the way things are going. Well, Rick, he has a different view of the world than General Valley and I do. Uh, he grew up at the knee of Frank Davis and the tutelage of Saul Alinsky and a whole host of other people that the mainstream media has failed to examine. And his vision of America is not for us to be a global superpower and to help maintain peace and economic growth in the world, but it's to, to be, we were the problem in his world when he grew up as a superpower and so he believes that uh, uh, differently than we do. And that's why he's been playing golf and going to fundraisers, whether it was the attack on Benghazi, and he goes to a fundraiser the next day, doesn't do anything to uh, help rescue those 33 people that survived and the four that were killed. Uh, or like today, which two years later, as we again go into another political campaign, he is not changing the alert status. Uh, I have recommended that we go to DEFCON 1, which is our highest alert status, as we lead into 9-11. We've never done that, and people say, well, why should we do that now? And I say, well, if you don't agree with DEFCON 1, what do you want to do? How do you alert American forces and our allies worldwide that there is a potential attack different than 9-11, the first one, but a potential attack against U.S. interests, as we had two years ago, as we led up to an election. And he had a political narrative of what the world should be. Osama bin Laden is dead. GM is alive. And he's trying to use the same political narrative now as he leads into these midterm elections, that everything is okay, don't get excited. Yet the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, has gone to uh, an increased alert status called SEVERE, which is their second highest in the United Kingdom, and we have done absolutely nothing. The president is avoiding the national security realities by trying to keep his political narrative that everything is going along well. So you can say he is, is brilliant because he has unilaterally disarmed us, when I was the Vice Commander-in-Chief of U.S. Air Forces Europe at the height of the Cold War in 1988, we had 4,000 tanks in Europe in, as part of NATO. We had five heavy mechanized divisions, as General Bowley knows so well, as he was part of that. And we could get five more in 10 days because we pre-positioned those tanks over there. And so we would have had 10 heavy armored or, or mechanized divisions. <clears throat> Today, we have zero tanks, I repeat, zero U.S. tanks in NATO. And our fighter wings over there are about 10% of what we had in the past. So he has unilaterally disarmed us. President Putin sees it. You have the synergy of what's going on with ISIS in Iraq, 
then what Hamas did to the Israelis, and then the movement into Crimea, and now into the eastern Ukraine. All I'm not saying this is orchestrated, but I'm saying it is targets of opportunity that our adversaries look at and see a world with a leaderless United States. So I believe the president has executed the game plan, the vision that he had when he said he was going to transform America. He has ensured our economics stay at one to one and a half percent without growth where we ought to be in four to seven percent with the potential we have with energy independence, with tax reductions, a whole host of things that we could do. Um, and he persists in uh, keeping Obamacare, which will make sure that we are never able to rearm because Obamacare will consume all the dollars in the U.S. Treasury that would normally go into the Defense Department. So, yes, he has done it what he wants brilliantly. But look at what kind of world we're in. We're on the verge of another global war, world war, with what's going on in the Ukraine and in the Middle East simultaneously. This is very, very worrisome. General McInerney, when you said on Fox News a week ago that we should go to DEFCON 1, it jolted a lot of us who are closely following the events in the world. Because I know what DEFCON 1 means. And for, for someone of your stature to say DEFCON 1, it made a lot of us sit up and go, how serious is this situation right now? But DEFCON 1 is that's nuclear war. war it, it's, nuclear war is imminent. Yes, sir. What, are we at that stage? Well, we are at a stage where we don't know. We are at a stage of there's so much uncertainty. You know, without nuclear war, we could have, well, there be partial nuclear, but an EMP weapon over the United States, just one weapon, could have the same impact as multi-nuclear weapons going off in U.S. cities in the long term. The cyber potentials of hitting our banks and smashing our economy. So the term DEFCON 1 was came out of the nuclear era against the Soviet Union. Nuclear war was imminent. My modification of that, Rick, is something is imminent and we are not paying attention whether it's nuclear, EMP, whether it's a cyber, no matter what it is, something is happening out there, and we're asleep at the switch like we were two years ago when those people in Benghazi knew, knew two weeks before they were going to be attacked that there was going to, going to be an attack, and no one did anything. And what I am also saying is, and I believe General Valley strongly agrees, that we are facing a crisis where military leaders know something is going to happen, not specifically maybe, but they have their responsibility for civilian leadership and authority, control of the military. But that is starting to run into the Constitution because each one of these generals and admirals have sworn to uphold the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So I believe we're going to be moving in in the coming weeks and months to a constitutional crisis for the military on orders that if you have a civilian military authority that lets things happen, like in Benghazi, and very soon this Friday there's a new book that's coming out called 13 Hours, and this is going to spell out what happened there, and this is going to just shock the American public, that we let this happen, and the president then went off to Las Vegas for a fundraiser. So I went said DEFCON 1 with a purpose in mind two weeks ago, General, uh, a week ago. What, when the commander-in-chief issues the order to go to DEFCON 1, what happens? Tell us, tell us in military terms, what, what is the chain of events that begins to happen? Well, we've never gone there, but I'll, I'll tell you in generalities what it is because part of it, I'm sure, is still classified. But the fact is, globally, every American military man 
and State Department and, and parts of the U.S. government are aware that we're in a very high threat situation. And we start preparing on the homeland, on emergency cities, et cetera, go to a higher alert status. It awakens everybody that we must be prepared for the very worst. And the, the DEFCON 1 could be put forth with certain caveats to it. The president could. But he could still get the same alert status. And for those that say, well, we shouldn't go to DEFCON 1, I say to them, all right, what do you want to do? Right now we are doing nothing. What is your recommendation? What should we be doing as we need into lead into 9-11? Every, and you have ISIS ripping across the Middle East. You've got Putin ripping through eastern Ukraine. You've got Hamas, although there's a temporary ceasefire. They're going to start it again. You've got potential of Hezbollah firing into Israel. So we have a global situation that our British allies, Prime Minister, is taking very seriously, and yet everything is fine in America. General Valley, um, General McInerney, you just said that we're moving into a constitutional crisis because the civilian commander in chief will not carry out his constitutional duties to protect the, the nation. As, uh, as a man who spent your entire life, uh, defending this country, um, what, what is, what's going through your head, your heart? At this time in 2014, as we watched the United States of America um, in a free fall. Well, I'll describe it in a meeting I had with uh, General L. C. C. last year. Uh, I've met him twice. Uh, I'm giving that as an example of a crisis that existed in Egypt. And sitting across uh, from General L. C. C. he said, you, you know, uh, America seems to be dealing now in politics and not in the realities of what is happening in the world. He said, here in Egypt, we have to deal with realities. And that was the most important thing he said to me. Uh, Because when you look at the White House, you look at uh, Obama and his team, they're constantly dealing in politics rather than the realities that Gerald McInerney has just described. So that's what brings us to a constitutional crisis. It is time that we call for a non-confidence vote in Congress to all stand tall and demand that this national security team uh, be relieved of their duties, be replaced. And if not so, then we must lead to impeachment because we cannot tolerate to put the entire United States, our population, our assets all over the world, our people, our families at risk any longer. That's how dangerous it is. Do you think House Speaker John Boehner would even allow a no-confidence vote to take place? I was with uh, uh, Mr. Boehner uh, two weeks ago out here in Montana, and I questioned him on a number of things. And, of course, uh, Speaker Boehner, he always has reasons for not doing things just like we had to really put a full-court press on him with the Benghazi Commission coalition that Gerald McInerney and I are a part of uh, to uh, press him for a select committee and appoint uh, Trey Gowdy. And that's coming to uh, fruition here, beginning with the uh, select committee hearings in September. So, no, John Boehner won't do it. But uh, it's, again, like Harry Reid. I ask uh, Speaker Boehner, how can one man... In our Senate, have so much power, and you don't take it away from them because you can't pay, play politics as usual anymore. We are at war, and Harry Reid is a detriment uh, to uh, making progress within our House of Representatives and the Senate with some 850 bills that he won't uh, bring to the floor. So. Congress is as much a fault, uh, Rick, uh, in many ways, because they don't have enough forceful leaders to stand up and be counted. Uh, They're good on getting on television now and being interviewed, as we see every day as we watch. Uh, But certainly uh, we have a a totally inept government right now, a government incapable 
incapable of making the right decisions to secure the republic. General Valley, do you, do you think that the current uh, so-called uh, humanitarian crisis on the Mexican border, do you think it's a real uh, crisis that just happened, or, or is this a coordinated invasion? All indications are that this has been planned out. The White House know about it. They're part of it, of opening the borders. It's part of the whole open border uh, uh, syndrome or policy uh, that uh, many would like to see happen where we don't have any borders at all. And, of course, this is uh, head right into that. And so uh, Stand Up America, which, uh, by the way, uh, General McInerney uh, was an initial and is currently a part of the Standing Up America, and we're so happy that uh, we get his support in what we're trying to do. And we came forth with a new article this morning uh, on the uh, on the southern border and what's happening there. Uh, there again, no strategy, uh, uh, really uh, nothing that's going to secure our borders, as General McInerney pointed out, with ISIS forces now teaming up with the drug cartels. And so uh, the biggest threat we have now, a lot of chatter going on, that something may happen in the Fort Bliss uh, Juarez area on on 9-11. So uh, that's the kind of alert to DEFCON that uh, General McInerney was alluding to, uh, which is a direct threat to our underbelly. And uh, it's been uh, assisted, planned out uh, by our White House in a wave. But yet uh, the cartels and ISIS will take advantage of that weakness. And that's exactly what General McInerney pointed out is why we need to go to a new, more clearly defined DEFCON 1 uh, for the country. General McInerney, I've been very outspoken on this radio program for years. I, I said in 2007, 2008, Barack Obama is a communist. This man is a enemy of the United States. He's going to... Um, bring about destruction of the republic uh i believe i believe time has proven me uh, to be correct in this this is not an issue of, of we've got an incompetent uh, uh buffoon in the white house i believe we have an enemy of the nation a domestic enemy in power in the white house who is orchestrating the destruction of our nation at what point I mean, you, you alluded to a constitutional crisis, but at what point do, do military commanders say enough is enough? Well, I think that if uh, we have a major incident uh, or an attack and this 9-11 and we have not done anything, that the American people and even the mainstream media, which has been complicit in protecting his agenda, and not reporting all these different crises, whether it's guns for hire, whether it's uh, the IRS, whether it's Benghazi, you go through the list of things, the border immigration crisis, with some say that this was orchestrated out of the White House, and um, all these signals that we sent, et cetera, and all these different challenges that America has that, frankly, are overwhelming the average American to listen and to keep track of it. Only people like you and General Valley and myself and a number of other people that are tracking this stuff and see it, does it start to fit a very carefully conceived and orchestrated pattern that some could say, well, the president was a community organizer, he didn't have the experience, etc., or... Some could say he is executing a very carefully orchestrated plan on how to change America, transform America, in his words, in a way that bring us to a socialistic, communistic society of redistributing wealth, et cetera, cutting our growth down, bringing in large amounts of immigrants that really want to live on the uh, U.S. government and our education, etc. You have governors out in California that welcome immigrants and they're paying for their college education when, in fact, it's the taxpayers. Your taxpayer payer base is, is being reduced greatly. Less than half the people in the country are paying taxes. And so we have a, a crisis 
not only in our economy and our national security, but also in the demographics that is being changed at such a dramatic pace that we have not previously seen in our history. And to answer your question, when do people come up and say enough is enough? That's a very good question. But I think that this coming 9-11 is going to uh, demonstrate is, it, is now the time. Do you, regarding uh, next uh, week, September 11, uh, are, are you making these remarks based on just gut feeling instinct, or do you have reason to believe something is underway? Well, the two are related. You don't see the actions that we've seen in the Middle East. You don't see the actions of an immigration crisis uh, and what's going on in the eastern Ukraine and what's going on in Korea and China where you have them buzzing uh, our P-8 aircraft, naval patrol aircraft, and all of a sudden you start to put these patterns together, you get a gut feeling, then you have these indicators. And as General Valley pointed out, what's going on in, in uh, Ciudad Juarez right across from El Paso? Very worrisome. At the beginning of the summer, when this uh, manufactured immigration crisis started, I, I said on this program, folks, I, you know, I can read the script. I know where this is going. In, in six months, we're going to have a a horrific terrorist attack in this country, and then we're going to be told by the politicians and the media, oh, the, the terrorists brought the weapon over the border. I mean, this is this is like watching a cheap, cheesy movie. The script is so cheesy. What they're doing, I, I don't know why more intelligent people don't discern what's happening. General Valley? Well, I'm with you. It is quite frightening. I mean, we, we, this isn't a movie. This isn't a, a, a reality TV show. We, we possibly could see millions of Americans killed in, in, a, in some type of weapon of mass destruction being set off in this country. And people are just going about their business like this is all make-believe, like it's on television. Well, it's a situation where America... Uh does not understand the global caliphate, does not understand radical Islam, and um, does not understand uh, those goals uh, to dominate uh, uh, the world again, So, uh, as, as they attempt to do uh, centuries uh, ago. Uh, we do have a group uh, that does understand that. Obviously, our national security team is very heavily influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, we have continued uh, reach-out programs to uh, radical Islamic-supported groups in the United States. And so when you have a mindset like that, and you only have a few of the media, such as uh, Newsmax uh, and Fox News and many radio stations that uh, uh, get the word out, we still have even a lot of educated people that I run into that are clueless about what's going on. So that's why Joe McInerney and I spent a lot of time uh, on television, on radio, uh, at events uh, with many others uh, to get the word out as to what really is happening. What is the reality of the situation today? Facing it head on, looking at those threats, coming up with a uh, strategy to deal with those threats, be ahead of the game, not behind it. General Valley, the, the, the reality is, from behind. General, the, excuse me, the, the reality is, that the U.S. government official foreign policy now is we support the jihadists. That's right. our official policy now. Yep, and uh, Claire Lopez, uh, who's uh, uh, a very important part of our Benghazi group, is clearly uh, defined as the uh, radicalization of our own White House and uh, radical Islamic sympathizers, Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers. So and this is treasonous. It was treasonous to release those uh, individuals from Guantanamo Bay uh, to Qatar, 
Uh, all of these things are treasonous activities. That's why we, we are at a constitutional crisis when we have a commander uh, who is, is conducting this kind of uh, uh, political uh, maneuvering and lying to the American people, a constant uh, aura of deception, as Joe McInerney mentioned, with the uh, Veterans Administration, with the IRS, with Homeland Security. And then the fact that uh, we don't have enough generals and admirals standing up, and that's what they need to do and abide by their oath to the Constitution of America and to the Republic. Thousands of American men died in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we have switched sides to support the very terrorists that killed them. I don't understand the silence. General McInerney, I mean, I, I, honestly, I'm outraged. I mean, I, I, we, we have switched sides. We're helping al-Qaeda. We're helping ISIS. These are the people that killed American servicemen. Why do we have to have this conversation on the radio? I mean, th- we ought to, you know, can you imagine in, in, in 1945, uh, Harry Truman coming into office after the death of FDR and switching sides to the Japanese and the Nazis? Well, <clears throat> this has never happened before in our republic's history. We have never had this kind of leadership that has such a different vision, and that's why it's so worrisome. Uh, I think that the American people, because the mainstream media has been complicit, uh, are still unaware, except for programs like yours and uh, a few others, of what's going on. I think if they fully understood that we did switch sides, that weapons went from Benghazi to ISIS in Syria through Turkey. General Bowley has visited Syria twice, aware of what's going on over there. We ended up supporting the wrong people. And so we're reaching a crisis in this republic that America must be aware, and it's coming fast. And that's why I'm so troubled that we have not changed our alert status uh, as we lead into 9-11. Those people that came through the southern border, Rick, are already in place. There's nothing we can do to stop them. And so it's like 9-11. Those 19 uh, radical Islamists, Al-Qaeda, were in the U.S. before 9-11. And so I think that the American people, and this radio station is very helpful in your program, in making America aware, but what are they going to do about it? What is going to happen to the republic if the American people don't stand up and get out of a political mode and become aware of what the national security realities are? We're, we're in the final two months of the congressional elections. Uh, I doubt if uh, the Congress will even uh, reconvene before the November election, but uh, um, every congressman will be visiting their home districts in the next two months looking for votes. People ought to be demanding right now, get your rear end back to Washington right now and, and, and declare no confidence in this government. Um, General McInerney, you, you've been, uh, in the past, you've expressed concern that the missing Malaysian airliner, uh, could return. Is that still a concern? Well, until we find debris in the South Indian Ocean, which I would love to find, then that airplane is a national security threat to the United States. I believe there's a potential, do not know, but I believe there's potential that an airplane could reemerge on 9-11 or at some other time, and it could go, for instance, nonstop from Iran or Pakistan or one of the stands into New York and not be de- detected through certain technological innovations. Uh, we should always be concerned until we find that there is a potential threat against us as national security. I don't know where it is. 
Are, are you I have, are you saying are you are you uh, saying that this airliner could fly under some type of cloaking technology that it's invisible? No, I'm not saying it's invisible. I'm just saying it if it got where I think it got, it did it through some very clever and innovative ways that it could do the same thing and could end up in Tel Aviv, London, New York, or Washington. You think it's in Pakistan? I, I don't know, Rick. Okay. I don't know. All right. Um, General Val- if I did, yes, I couldn't sir. tell you. Yes, sir, I understand. I understand. Gen- General Valley, uh, you know, uh, Clara Lopez has been on this program often. Uh, she was here directly after the uh, Benghazi debacle. We have stated repeatedly on this program that this was a gun running operation. I also maintained for years that Fast and Furious was also a gun running operation, but it was arming revolutionaries in Mexico to come over the border at a certain time with the weapons. Have have you ever thought about that possibility? Well, uh, not that particular uh, scenario. Uh, I, I think, again, it was a uh, an inept operation put into place, uh, as they said, probably naively to plant weapons down there so they could truck, track them to the drug cartels and others. And, of course, it completely went 180 degrees the other way, and unfortunately we lost uh, a great American down there in that debacle. Uh, again, uh, some of this is planned out. Uh, some of it is just naivete of uh, of a commander-in-chief who's been elected uh, who uh, does not comprehend war, does not understand it, has no vision of uh, strategy at all. And again, it goes back to this ineptness uh, we've talked about. Uh, we cannot afford to put amateurs uh, in charge of our government and national security because they're dealing with pros like Putin. That's why Putin is getting away with what he does, because he knows he can do it, because he knows the rest of the world is weak. The Chinese see the same thing. They see the same thing in Tehran. Uh, Baghdadi uh, and uh, ISIS sees the same thing. And so when you don't have uh, peace through strength, then uh, you're vulnerable, and that's where we are now, and that's what Gerald McInerney has laid out very clearly, how vulnerable the United States is. I assume uh, both of you gentlemen are familiar with uh, former uh, the Soviet Union intelligence defector Alexander Golitsyn and his uh, book in 1995, uh, Perestroika Deception. Have you considered the possibility that we're watching Perestroika Deception unfold in front of us, which is a carefully laid out plan to to weaken the United States, uh, bring about the destruction of NATO and and move the United States into some type of global communistic system? Well, Russia well, has always been an expert at deception, as Joe McInerney knows. That's uh, part of uh, of how they work, uh, and they're masters at it. Uh, and we have let down uh, any kind of uh, psychological, strategic psychological operations against uh, the Russians and others because we say we can't do those kinds of things, and... Uh, so uh, we, an uh, important part of war uh, is uh, deception, as you know, and uh, uh, taking the enemy down a road where uh, you want him to go rather than where he wants to go. So uh, that's all part of uh, Russia. They're still uh, tops in the world as the Chinese are. They're just very good at it. We're not. General, you were, uh, Valley, you were involved in PSYOPs. Is uh, somebody yes. using PSYOPs on us? Of course. <laughs> every day and uh it seems to be working and so yeah it's working very well and again it's naivete of our media to pick up on that uh, and that's why uh, we keep losing because we're losing the psychological operations uh, side of things and the use of uh social networking today uh much of that is uh, what we call white psyops uh, where they put out messages uh and some of them are true, some of them aren't. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, our enemies know how to use our media to their advantage, and that is pure psychological operation. All right, final question before I uh, let both of you gentlemen go. Um, in the event that we have a 
horrific terrorist attack in this country in the, in the coming months. And the U.S. Congress continues to do nothing, and Barack Obama does nothing. I'd like to hear from both of you, what should the American people do? General well, McInerney? General people should, I'll go ahead, General McInerney, let him go ahead first, please. Well, I think we have all different views on that. We have a Constitution that we must <clears throat> uphold. And uh, General Valley and I both swore to uphold that against all enemies, foreign and, I repeat, domestic. We have certain ways to do that. There's a balloting box coming up in two months. Um, there, there are other things. But if you have an administration that turns out <clears throat> is aiding and abetting the enemy, that's a very serious charge. And we have never faced that in our history. So this is unchartered territory, uh, and it's very worrisome, and I do not have the answer, Rick. I, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but it's very dangerous. Do we, do we stand as a people and demand a, a total resignation of the entire White House administration? Absolutely, and that's the right of the people and the citizens when you have a tyrannical government and a government out of control that's not representing the people. People can always stand up, and that's our rights as U.S. citizens, as other citizens of the world, and you've seen what they've done in uh, the Middle East, for example. People stand up. That's what they did in Egypt. And I'm afraid, uh, as one uh, individual told me, uh, Joe Valley's going to take divine intervention to change this country. <laughs> that may well be true, uh, but, but also it uh, may be a cataclysmic event uh, that we've been talking about today uh, that occurs to wake the American people up. I think it's going to be one or the other. I'm not sure politics as usual is going to change this country, but we're hopeful that the elections will prove to be more positive than not uh, this coming November. I, I'm leaning on the uh, divine intervention. I have no confidence <laughs> at all in, in the politicians. Uh, my guest today, uh, retired Major General Paul Valley and retired U.S. Air Force uh, Lieutenant General Tom McInerney. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on True News today. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much, Rick. Well, I think you'll agree that was a very sobering uh, interview with uh, General Valley and, and General McInerney. Um, a number of, of key points uh, coming back to my mind. First of all, uh, we now know that when General McInerney said last week that on September 7, there would be a book with earth-shattering information published. Uh, we now know it's uh, it, it does involve Benghazi. I believe that book is entitled uh, 13 Hours. It will be released on September 7. Also, uh, General McInerney did not back down at all about his call for DEFCON 1. And when I said, you know what DEFCON 1 means he immediately responded nuclear war is imminent that is extremely troubling uh, because i i know this man's resume in the military and uh, for him to say something that strong indicates to me that he is very very concerned that we could be facing a weapon of mass destruction in the very near future. Worst case scenario is that he believes Russia is prepared to take action against the United States. All of this uh, very, very disturbing. I pray that you would share this program with as many people as possible. Help me out with this and tell everybody to listen to this program. God bless. See you tomorrow. As the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in New Hampshire, he's a former senator from Massachusetts. And while he was in Congress, he introduced a bill to revoke the American citizenship of terrorists, which didn't go anywhere. Which, you know, senator, you think, well, it just seems pretty non-controversial, and yet it was. Why? Well, politics always plays a role in the United States Senate, unfortunately. When you have a good idea, there are those who want to kill those ideas. It's something, actually, I was very thankful to see after I spoke to Ted Cruz, uh, that he, in fact, filed to make sure that we have and we know that there are maybe 300-plus people fighting for ISIS. And what they've done is they've 
I think, given up their citizenship and left it at the door. And if they go back and forth, they're not coming back to the United States to buy a house with a white picket fence. They're coming back to, to hurt and kill us and change our way of life. So they can't hide behind the Constitution and the rights provided by our Constitution and taking away that passport, the, the passports. Let's keep them there with their new friends. It seems like they say, look, the, the reason the bill didn't go anywhere and the reason Ted Cruz's proposal has similar pushback is you can't just willy-nilly revoke the citizenship of somebody suspected to be a terrorist without giving them due process. Well, with all, with all due respect, uh, it's not willy-nilly. I can see how people would like to... Uh, you know, belittle and demonize uh, this opportunity to really uh, make sure that we can protect our citizens. These are people who are online that we've identified who have said we are going to go to the United States to march down Pennsylvania Avenue, a plant, a flag in the White House that we know are U.S. citizens who have taken up arms. And we're not talking about, you know, maybe we sort of kind of think. We know who they are. We've identified them through reliable sources beyond a reasonable doubt. At that point, they should not be given and given given the protections of uh, the United States because they have left them at the door. They have taken up arms to kill us and change our way of life. And if they want to stay in their country, their new country, then let's keep them there so they don't come back here to hurt our citizens. It's like we're, we're you know, if we met these people on the battlefield over in Syria, we would bomb them. But if they show up at JFK with a U.S. passport, we welcome them. Well, we have to fix it. If you don't think that we're under threat right now, uh, as you know, I have said uh, the, bo the border needs to be closed. It's too porous. We have had reports from Homeland that there are potential ISIS threats uh, potentially moving forward. Uh, this is something where Senator Shaheen and I differ greatly. Democratic uh, I voted to secure the border, voted for border uh, troops. She hasn't. She supports the DREAM Act and the like. I would hope that before the Senate leaves for session, they do a couple of things. They take up the ability for us to close the border. It needs to be closed. We need to secure it, folks. It's a, a part of our national security and, quite frankly, our economic security. And they should also take up something like this when we know who these people are to make sure that we can keep them there so they can't flow back and forth like they potentially can do and hide behind our citizenship and their rights mm -hmm. uh, guaranteed under the Constitution. They've left them, as I said, I hate to keep repeating it, they've left them at the door. They've given up that privilege. Senator Brown is in a race right now against Democrat Jean Shaheen for this seat in New Hampshire, and we shall see. Right now she's leading you by a bit in the polls, but some say it's tighter than they expected on the No, that's not true, side. but uh, not, thank are you. Uh, are you beating everything's her? Everything's going well, and we're working hard, and I appreciate uh, Appreciate the opportunity to get on. All right. We're going to be watching uh, come midterm election. Senator, good to see you. Over this past week, the army of ISIS swallowed up parts of Iraq like a darkness. In just one day, tens of thousands of Christians fled villages like Karakush and Bartilla, just about 25 miles away. Most have come here to Erbil with nothing more than the clothes on their back. They take everything from the house, from the store. Everything. And they take like a machine, everything, because they are Christian. Just the name Christian. They hit Christian especially. We don't know why. It was leave or die. They say if anyone don't become like Muslim, we're going to kill him. Kill it. Each one. From baby and uh, woman, one, old man. We don't have anything here. They bombed the churches and already took our houses. We have nothing here. No money, no ID, no travel documents. What's happening now to the Christians, to the Yazidis, to the minorities, and like in the last couple of days, to the, mostly to the Christians, is it's a genocide. What's happening is what happened 200 years ago with the Jews. Dr. Ahmed hears stories of the barbarism of ISIS. That ISIS was killing, shooting the kids and the uh, people, and they are laying, laying them on the ground, and they bring tractors that they walk over them in the front of their families. They take women out of their houses, so let's say every each family that they have three, three daughters, they, they would take one. In the wake of the ISIS advance, thousands of ethnic Yazidis escaped to a mountain outside the town of Sinjar. While these Christians found shelter at this Catholic compound in Erbil. A few weeks ago, these families fled when ISIS cleansed Mosul of Christians. ISIS gave them an ultimatum. 
They gave us four choices, either convert to Islam, or paying tax, or leaving the city, or the sword. They are using the sword to cut off hand, and also beheading others. So I don't think this is the behavior of human beings, but wild animals do that. ISIS looted their properties and left them destitute. They took this woman's dentures, wedding ring, and documents. They took everything. We asked them, please give us something to show that we owned our car, our home. They said, here you have nothing. ISIS searched the home of one Christian in Mosul and discovered these two New Testaments, one with a camouflage on the cover and the other with an American flag inside. They accused them of being both a missionary and a spy. ISIS put his name on a list. He told his story, but asked us to hide his identity. Hey, hey, stop. Get back. You are, you are a Christian. The terrorist uh, told me we will kill you. Sometimes the pressure is overwhelming. <laughs> Forgive them. Forgive them. Because they didn't know. They didn't know what they were, what they act. Even though these Christians are the original people of the region, many simply want to leave. They're pleading for the U.S., the U.N., and Pope Francis to help. We are asking the responsible states of the international community to come and look and see how all the people are living here. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Erbil, Kurdistan. This is Gary Lane reporting. The ongoing U.S. air campaign in northern Iraq over the weekend helped Iraqi Kurdish forces regain two towns held by Islamic State fighters. On Saturday, two U.S. fighter jets struck several targets near Sinjar. Democrats praise the president's decision to launch the air strikes. I think these targeted strikes are very effective. The Kurds are uh, very aggressive uh, with this support. I think they will be able to stabilize the situation in the north. And with arms provided by the United States. The Obama administration has decided to send direct military weapons to the Kurdish military, the Peshmerga. Previously, the U.S. sent military aid only to the Iraqi government. Will it be enough to stop the Islamic militants? On Meet the Press Sunday, New York Congressman Peter King said the Islamic State is a formidable foe stronger than Al Qaeda. They have 10 times, 20 times more money than Al Qaeda ever had. They have much more weapons than Al Qaeda ever had. And ISIS has hundreds of foreign fighters with them available to come to the United States to attack us. That's the reality. And while the U.S. military action has slowed the Islamic State advance for now, the Islamists still control the Mosul Dam, a big prize in the north, because it provides water and electricity to the entire area. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. I want to show you a map now of where it is the, uh, you see this enormous uh, red on that map. That is the territory that ISIS has taken. They've taken a huge swath of Syria and a huge swath of Iraq. And uh, you see over to the right a small area that is the uh, Kurdistan area at Erbil, the capital. That's where our reporter is right now. Now, the Christians in Mosul have been cleansed out, and the Mosul Dam is at the north of that. And if that is ruptured, uh, it can flood the entire Tigris-Euphrates Valley all the way down to Baghdad, and they can cut off the water of Baghdad. So you can see how strategic it is, lying between Turkey and Syria, if Syria falls to them, and it may, then what's next? Right below that is Jordan, and right beside that is Israel. And uh, the rest of Iraq, then you're looking at who knows where they want to go. But uh, I think, in my opinion, I've been praying. The Christians there are in desperate shape. Uh, those uh, people that are in the Sinjar Mountains, a small sect, in desperate shape <clears throat> and although the president has done something I think he's too late he kept saying well uh, Maliki has to form a government before we can help and finally uh, they realized the Peshmerga forces of the uh, uh, people uh, in Kurdistan the Kurds uh, will fight but they didn't have any ammunition they, they, they ran out of bullets so finally, we're getting something to us. Well, I am privileged to say that on this program, we have a retired general, Paul Vallely. 
He has more than 15 years' experience in special operations and other military operations during 22 years of distinguished service in the Army. General, it's a pleasure to have you with us on the 700 Club. Good morning, Pat. Happy to be with you and to be able to add some information uh, to your program this morning on the Middle East. Well, I need it very badly. I understand you're in touch with four intelligence teams working in Iraq. To, to what are they telling you? Well, the intel teams that we have uh, basically are uh, out of uh, Turkey uh, and the Free Syrian Army with Inside Syria, who I've been working with uh, for about 18 months. I've been in the Middle East five times, Pat, in the last 18 months, and the only one has been Inside Syria as far as Aleppo uh, last year, and then uh, to Egypt twice uh, within the last uh, seven months. So uh, by being over there on the ground, you can certainly get a better idea of that chessboard. When you look at that, map, Pat, look at it as a chessboard. Look at all the players there. Now you see that red area you were talking about is the beginning of uh, the Levant, which extends all the way from uh, Turkey all the way down to Egypt. And so ISIS will continue to tear down those borders and continue to expand as they recruit around the world. And they got recruits coming in from all over the place, Europe, Middle East, uh, as well as the United States. So this is a real uh, dire situation uh, much worse in many ways than uh, Hitler in this genocide that's going on. John, do, do you think the president understands what's happening? It looks like he was just dribbling aid to the Peshmerga. They were ready to fight. I know from a political standpoint, he didn't want to put, quote, boots on the ground, so we've got some airstrikes. We won't stop ISIS with just airstrikes, will we? Well, we can, uh, but uh, when you say boots on the ground, it's sort of a misnomer because uh, we always have intel on the ground. And in the case over there, we have special operations forces that provide air uh, ground operations, just like if you remember the beginning of Afghanistan in the fall of uh, 2001 with 100 special operators and CIA uh, paramilitary and air power, we basically... Uh, uh, purged the entire al-Qaeda and Taliban forces, and of course they fled into Pakistan. And we did that in 34 days. So with the proper air power, the use of the combat talons, the MC-130s, uh, gunships, uh, we have B-52s, Diego Garcia, we have the fleet forces uh, with the uh, George Bush uh, aircraft carrier group, we have assets in Italy. So we have plenty of assets to come in there. And Pat, here's what I would do. I would give a general patent order. And I would tell the four-star, the head of Central Command, two words, destroy ISIS. That's all they need. Let the generals win this thing and get it over. And let the rest of the country stand up as well and join in. Because it's going to affect them in the Middle East and Europe and other parts of the world just, just the same. in this global caliphate that's forging on. Is that order ever going to be given? If I was there, I would give it. But under President uh, Obama, uh, he's such an amateur. Uh, he basically lives in the twilight zone, as his staff does, his national security team does. Uh, we've got to get uh, a better national security team in there. We've got to remove the people in Washington because they're taking us on national suicide. And you can see the suicide that's going on in the Middle East. Uh, uh, by the countries not participating and assisting to destroy ISIS. So uh, uh, we, we just need strong leaders, and we don't have them right now, unfortunately. Uh, you, you're talking about Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and President. You talk about all three of them? Susan Rice, all of them need to go. They need to be replaced immediately. Now, unfortunately, in our Constitution, we, we can only do impeachment, but uh, we are generating what we call a no-confidence resolution in Congress this week that hopefully will lead to impeachment because we cannot let uh, this regime in Washington continue to take us over the cliff. Uh, we just can't do it. America is too special to all of us in our national security. Without it, Pat, uh, we have nothing. General, oh, 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 let's talk about over the cliff. What happens? I mean, I, I have this sense in my heart, and I really feel deeply about this, and I'm sure you do too, uh, that uh, this inaction is going to destroy us. Uh, how, how critical is it over the cliff? What happens if we don't act? Well, then you hope for divine intervention. <laughs> but there will be cataclysmic events. 
there'll be cataclysmic events within the year, I can tell you that, uh, for what I foresee out there. Uh, but when we purge the military, when we give pink slips uh, to our forces and members over in Afghanistan now, and they're coming back, uh, the entire military, senior officers, enlisted people have been purged of what they can train with. They can't even say radical Islam. They don't know how to say and won't say victory anymore. So we need uh, very strong leaders in Washington today uh, to be able to turn this country around. And I call it national suicide. I call America at a crossroads right now. America at a crossroads. Let's take a few of the tactical things in, uh, in confronting us. What would you do with Peshmerga? What would you do with that Sinjar, those uh, civilians, those uh, people that are isolated? What would you do for them? Well, I would uh, use my special operator forces, uh, less than 100 over there, to make sure that the inventories and the ammunition and the weapons uh, are provided to Peshmerga immediately. We can bring them in by air. Uh, we have airfields up there in Kurdistan. Uh, we certainly can still bring... Uh, into Baghdad airport, though I understand last night they tightened up the security in Baghdad to the nth degree uh, that they had not done before because they feel that uh, Baghdad's being encircled. At the same time, I would target, uh, laser target uh, those uh, targets of convoys, uh, mass uh, command and control uh, uh, troops that we can find over there and you know we can pinpoint a license plate uh, on a car with our intelligence capability so we can find where they are hunt them out target them and take them out destroy isis that's the word general, general i commend you you're a great patriot and i couldn't agree with you more with what you're saying thank you so much for being here and, and may, may god bless you well, ladies, ladies god bless you pat let's have some divine intervention America watches in horror as ISIS apparently beheads a second American, also a journalist, and now there are new warnings that ISIS could strike right here in the United States and soon. This is a direct threat to the United States of America, that it may be one of the biggest we've ever faced. These groups, they don't need any excuse. They will attack us whenever they can. They have announced that they don't intend to stop. They have announced that they will come after us if they can, that they will, quote, spill our blood. This is a threat that we are monitoring. It's one that we have been focused on for quite some time. The United States is always the main target of these terrorist organizations. They will hit us at home. And the king of Saudi Arabia warning that the terrorists will reach Europe in one month and America in another month. Our next guest has been investigating ISIS author William Forston joins us. Good evening, sir. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you even on this sad day. It is extremely sad. It is so disheartening to Americans. We just went through this a couple of days ago, still haven't recovered, and we're back at it again. Um, sir, um, looking at, uh, at ISIS, I mean, to do terrorism in the United States, you just have to get in here, a passport. Many of them can get that, and, and then get the means in here. Are there soft targets here that we need to worry about? I wrote the book, Day of Wrath, precisely for that reason. ISIS uses asymmetrical warfare. They're masters of social media. They're masters of terrorism. In my book, Day of Wrath, I outline a scenario of going for the soft targets. What are the soft targets in our culture? American schools, American churches, American synagogues. ISIS murderers will not stop simply because there's a sign on the door saying no gun zone. We have to completely rethink the security of our schools immediately because they're already inside this country. Who's in charge? Who's the leader of ISIS? He was actually a POW for a while, uh, and then we let him go, which I find absolutely uh, amazing. He currently defines himself as the Caliph. Why I wrote the book Day of Wrath is I became concerned as a history professor and teacher that everything ISIS has said they're going to do, they have done. They make the Nazis, they make Stalin's and KVD look like amateurs in comparison. There are things I know, Greta, you've seen that you cannot show the American public. I researched it while I was working on the book Day of Wrath, and it is frightening. All right, so the only choice really is to eliminate them. I mean, there's, we're not going to reason with them. We're not going to deal with them. There's no bargaining. These are savages, right? Do you bargain with Satan? Uh, I, 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 I just call them <laughs> savages. I don't, I don't think we can bargain with them. The next question is, how, you know, is how, do, we, how do we eliminate them? I mean, what, you know, how do we do that? 
Greta, uh, I'm deeply disturbed. I'm old enough to recall in 1962 when we confronted a crisis in Cuba, the President of the United States, Jack Kennedy, laid out a very clear policy on day one. We have a strategy, either this or else. I was horrified on the week my book, Day of Wrath, came out when our leader said he has no strategy. Is that not a message to come and get us? We have to take the war to them. Do you think he was talking about Syria? Do you think he was being candid or that he misspoke or do we have no strategy? Does he not see the seriousness of ISIS? And, and look, you know, getting ISIS in Iraq is not going to solve the problem because they're growing in Syria. I mean, it doesn't do any good just to get, try to get them in Iraq. There's no room for a president of the United States to misspeak, especially to the world, especially when we're facing ISIS. You and I have both seen video of them decapitating children, the murderous regime that they're imposing, and they have promised they will bring it here. King of Saudi Arabia has warned us. I see at least the leadership in Great Britain is doing something about it. That's right. why I wrote Day of Wrath. President Obama calls it ISIL. We call it ISIS. Um, does it make any bit of difference? Or, you know, is there any sort of, like, have you figured out why we're using different words? Let's just call them murderous thugs. All right, so there's no, so there's no we shouldn't read anything into it that uh, the media stays with ISIS and the president stays with ISIL. It means nothing. It means nothing to me other than the fact that we have to eliminate them because they are already inside the United States. We heard clear warnings from some of our elected representatives. They are coming and they are masters it, of asymmetrical it, warfare. Is their goal only a caliphate or, or is their goal far beyond? Is their goal to reach into the United States? I mean, if they had their caliphate, would that be the end of it or are they, they want so much more? They want blood. Greta, it's a, it's a terrible scenario that we have to look at, but by their interpretation of the Koran, the ultimate goal is the infidel is dead and their religion is supreme. There is no room for compromise with these people anymore. There's no coexistence. Now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. And the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain territory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. It is recognized by no government, nor by the people it subjugates. ISIL is a terrorist organization, pure and simple, and it has no vision other than the slaughter of all who stand in its way. In a region that has known so much bloodshed, these terrorists are unique in their brutality. They execute captured prisoners. They kill children. They enslave, rape, and force women into marriage. They threaten the religious minority with genocide and in acts of barbarism. They took the lives of two American journalists, Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. So ISIL poses a threat to the people of Iraq and Syria and the broader Middle East, including American citizens, personnel, and facilities. If left unchecked, these terrorists could pose a growing threat beyond that region, including to the United States. While we have not yet detected specific plotting against our homeland, ISIL leaders have threatened America and our allies. Our intelligence community believes that thousands of foreigners, including Europeans and some Americans, have joined them in Syria and Iraq. Trained and battle-hardened, these fighters could try to return to their home countries and carry out deadly attacks. Fox News strategic analyst Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters is with us tonight. Colonel, how are you? I'm fine. Always good when I'm talking to you, Sean. I, I want to ask, because you and I have talked a lot about the disconnect with the administration and the vacations and the lack of urgency that I think is needed at this moment in time. John Kerry said the real face of Islam is a peaceful religion, and then simultaneously said Scripture commands the U.S. to protect Muslim countries against global warming. My, my question is, are they not getting how dangerous this threat is? And there are some that liken this to 1938. Would you liken this to 1938, the rise of radical Islam? Well, certainly somewhere in the 1930s. But look, John Kerry doesn't know anything about any religion. Uh, he's a member of the, the, this poxy elite that doesn't take religion seriously. Uh, you trying to convince me he's read the Quran? 
which I have, by the way. Uh, he probably, I doubt he's read the Bible all the way through. And one of the fundamental problems we have is these people, these insiders who went to the right prep schools and the Ivy League universities and have been social ins and insiders all their lives, our governing elite of both parties to a, to a degree, they don't understand the power of faith. I mean, even if Islamic State, were, if the terrorists were broke, which they were originally, they would have this passion. And what has been driving them, what has let them roll over the, the Iraqi army that didn't have any passion, didn't have any beliefs, is this power, this force, this transformative fury of faith in flame. They believe they are on a mission from their God to subjugate the world, to kill unbelievers who will not convert, and oh, by the way, have a lot of fun just killing people for fun along the way. I mean, our leaders don't understand bloodlust in young men. They don't understand the power of faith. They don't understand how brutal most of the world is. And that's why we have a vacuum right. of leadership. So, all right, let's say that the estimate, we have, what, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Let's, let's say that that number is right. We always hear about radical Islamists, be it Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Boko Haram, the Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS, ISIL, Al-Qaeda. They all have Sunni Shia, they have one common denominator. They want to wipe Israel off the map, kill Jews, and they want this caliphate, all these radical Islamist groups. Then you see and they have, want to attack the United States. And attack the United States. Then you've got moderate Muslims, far too many of which their voices are, are silent, either out of fear or maybe some agree silently with those radicals. And then you have a few brave people that will speak out about the hijacking of their religion. Why are so many moderate Muslims that we hear about so unwilling to take on the hijacking of their religion? Well, I think they come in a lot of different flavors. I think some are afraid. Certainly, if you live in Iraq or Syria, you're afraid. Um, if you're in the United States, I think a lot of successful Muslims in the United States uh, just don't want any part of any of this. They're embarrassed. Uh, they just want to get on with their lives and be good Americans. I tell folks, look, look at the profiles of the terrorists we're exporting to the Middle East. These aren't the, 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 this isn't the pediatrician from your local clinic, critic who, a clinic who was educated in Pakistan. These tend to be jailbird conver converts, uh, you know, white guys who decide they're going to do it for Allah. So, uh, you know, it's 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 critical not to tar all Muslims with this radical brush. But at the same time, uh, our president and all the presidents, men and women, need to recognize that in Middle Eastern Islam. There is a deep, a profound sickness that stems from the collapse of this civilization, from basically civilizational incompetence. They're not competitive in, in any sphere. What has the Middle East imported to the rest of the world in the last century? Oil and terror. They manufacture nothing. Even the quality of the Iranian carpets have, has collapsed. And they're shamed, they're embarrassed, All they're right. angry, and they blame us for their sins. Then, then, then let's, let's look at the role of the United States and especially this president. There, there was an article in Breitbart today by Ben Shapiro. Five times Obama spoke loudly and carried a tiny stick. And he mentions Ukraine. He mentions Syria, Iran, Libya, and China. Five examples. Now we have the president saying we have no strategy yet to deal with ISIS. Then out comes Joe Biden saying we're going to chase, chase them to the gates of hell. Um, are they really willing to do that? Is, if, is the president, if he's going to get an international coalition and says it's manageable, does that sound like somebody that's willing to chase these people beheading Americans involved in a desire for a caliphate to the gates of hell? Do you think this president is up yeah. to that task? No, of course not. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think any Democrat really believes it. I don't think Debbie Wasserman Schultz believes he's up to the task. They're running scared. But it's about more than politics. So let's, Sean, let's talk about this coalition. Remember how the Democrats belittled George Bush for going it alone in, in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He had 48 nations behind him, 40 of which contributed military contingents. His father did a brilliant job of building a remarkable coalition for Desert Storm. Now Obama, 
Well, let's see. You know, Bush had a c coalition of the willing. Let's uh, see if uh, Obama has a coalition of the chilling. Because I will tell you, he is not going to get our allies to step up in, a, in the way George Bush did. He's not going to get neutral states and others in the Middle East to step up. Why? Because they cannot trust Obama. He screwed over the East Europeans on missile, missile defense and to get an arms, a crappy arms deal with Putin. He's bailed out our allies in Iraq. He's run NATO all over the map in Afghanistan. He's drawn red line after red line. Never lived up to any of it. He won't call an invasion of Ukraine an invasion. Uh, he won't call a war a, a, a war. He won't call Islamist terrorists Islamist terrorists. This president is a terrified little man in a great big job he can't do. And let me ask you, we had Phil Robertson on this program. He used the term convert them or kill them. Got a lot of anger in the, in the liberal media. Um, isn't it really, they, they either change their ways of beheading innocent people, threatening to wipe Israel off the map, attacking America, convert or die philosophy, or we have to adopt the philosophy to kill them. Isn't that the only way to deal with them? I don't see any situation under which we can negotiate with people that have that religious fanatical ideology. No, you can't. You can't negotiate with somebody who believes they're on a mission from their God to kill you. Again, Sean, 2,000 years of well-documented history of radical, fanatical religious insurgencies in every major religion. Not one in 2,000 years has been put down by negotiations or concessions or just being nice. You kill them. And oh, by the way, these uh, Islamic State terrorists beheading American journalists, slaughtering unarmed Iraqis by the hundreds, killing um, Iraqi Christians, uh, attacking Yazidis and it's killing them, raping, looting. It is unbelievable. And these are the people you know, Colonel, that the American left doesn't want to waterboard. You know, after Vietnam and after we just lost Iraq, which 4,000 Americans died, shed their blood for, lost limbs for, you know, I've always had the greatest respect for people like yourself that have served our country. And if I'm looking at, at, at us giving up all of our gains in Iraq, I don't know if I could in good conscience recommend that any American sign up for the military under this leadership. If we're going to give back, if they risk their blood and treasure and, and give up their lives only to give it back a year later, I, I really well, could not all, in good conscience well, recommend people serve under those circumstances. Well, I, I can. First of all, we, didn't, we, the people, didn't lose Iraq. Our politicians Obama did. gave it away. Well, Obama that's the point. gave it away. But as far as a military, Sean, you got to remember, administrations come and go. But by God, the U.S. Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, and now the Air Force. But, you, but if your son Corps, dies they in Iraq, stay. they're always here. And the very city he died fighting for that we won is now given back. Are you not a parent saying, wh wh why? What, what reason did my son fight here? If we gave it up because no. politics literally is seeping into military decisions. Yeah, the left doesn't like it, but look, the military is the foundation that keeps this country safe. Totally agree. Presidents come and go, but the, our values, military ethics, the, the ideals of service, even under the worst presidents, there's never been a coup, never a suggestion of one. We, we, we are loyal to the Constitution and the Commander-in-Chief as long as he obeys the Constitution. And, and I, I do... I, I, you, you know what I'm saying here, right? on, you, you understand. I, I, I do. But I'm saying, you know, the military is the one institution we must preserve at all costs because they will war. see us through the we, terrible times. We have allowed these people in Washington to politicize it, and guys that gave their lives for these cities deserve better than what they have gotten here. Of course they do, but the U.S. Army will outlast this president. All right, Colonel, thank you so much. Coming up, left-wing liberals ratchet. Dear Mr. President, with all due respect, sir, I must tell you that you are wrong about ISIL. You said ISIL speaks for no religion. I'm a former Muslim. My dad is an imam. I spent more than 20 years studying Islam. You're getting cool back I hold there. a bachelor degree in religious studies, and I'm in the middle of so my master's degree in terrorism studies. I can tell you with confidence that ISIL speaks for Islam. Allow me to correct you, Mr. President. ISIL is a Muslim organization. Its name stands for Islamic State. So even the name suggests that it is an Islamic movement. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, 
holds a PhD in Islamic studies. I doubt you know Islam better than he does. He was a preacher and a religious leader in one of the local mosques in Baghdad. ISIL's 10,000 members are all Muslims. None of them are from any other religion. They come from different countries and have one common denominator, Islam. They are following Islam's prophet Muhammad in every detail. They imitate him by growing their beards, shaving their mustaches, and in the way they dress. They follow his command in the hadith to differentiate themselves from the infidels by wearing, by wearing their watches on the right instead of the left hand. They implement Sharia in every piece of land they conquer. They pray five times a day. They have called for a caliphate, which is a central doctrine in Sunni Islam, and they are willing to die for their religion. They are following the steps of Islam's prophet Muhammad to the letter. By the way, if you want to understand ISIL, read the oldest biography of Muhammad by Ibn Hisham. This is their model for action. You think that ISIL does not speak for Islam because they beheaded an American and they killed those whom they consider infidels. In the same way, Islam's prophet Muhammad beheaded in one day between 600 and 900 adult males in a Jewish tribe called Banu Quraiza. In fact, Beheading is commanded in the Quran, in Surah 47, the fourth verse. It says, when you meet the unbelievers and fight, smite at their necks. Ironically, this Surah is called the Surah of Muhammad. Killing prisoners is also an order from Allah to Muhammad and to all Muslims. It says, it is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. Quran 8.67 And by the way, three of Muhammad's wives were Jewish girls he kidnapped from his raids on religious minorities, just as ISIL is doing today. Mr. President, I grew up in Morocco, supposedly a moderate country, yet I still learned at a young age to hate the enemies of Allah especially Jews and Christians. These are represented today by Israel and the West, especially the great Satan, America. I prayed five times a day, repeating Al-Fatiha, the first chapter in the Quran, asking Allah to lead me not in the way of those who went astray and those who have the wrath of Allah upon them. We all knew that it is Jews and Christians. We have been brainwashed to hate all of you in our sacred texts, in our prayers, in our Friday sermons, in our educational systems. We were ready to join any group that one day would fight you and destroy you and make Islam the religion of the whole world, as the Quran says. This is what I and millions like me have been taught. Mr. President, this is an irrevocable fact. Fortunately, when I grew up, I chose to leave Islam and became a Christian because I believed that God is love. Others also left and still every day they are leaving Islam and choosing different paths for their lives. All of them are suffering today because again, Islam's prophet Muhammad said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. I left Morocco under persecution. I was fortunate. Others throughout the Muslim world do not have the same opportunity. They are paying a heavy price in different ways in order to get their freedom one day. I ask you, Mr. President, to stop being politically correct, to call things by their names. ISIL, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Taliban, and their sister brand names are all made in Islam. Unless the Muslim world deals with Islam and separates religion from state, we will never end this cycle. Until you deal with the root of the problem, 
will be just dealing with the symptoms. ISIL is just one symptom. If it disappears, other ISILs will be born under different names. You might ask, then why does ISIL kill other Muslims? The answer is that they consider them infidels, not Muslims. Do you know that all four schools in Islam agree that if a Muslim stops praying, he should be asked to repent, and if he does not, he should be killed? Do you know that Muhammad tried to burn his own companions when they stopped coming to prayers? So anything that qualifies a Muslim to be an infidel can be a reason for killing him, even neglecting to pray. If Islam is not the problem, then why is it that there are millions of Christians in the Middle East, and yet none of them has ever blown up himself to become a martyr? Even though they live under the same economic and political circumstances, and even worse. Why have many Muslims in the West also joined ISIL if Islam is not the reason? Why have even new converts to Islam become terrorists? Mr. President, if you really want to fight terrorism, then fight it at the root. How many Saudi sheikhs are preaching hatred? How many Islamic channels are indoctrinating people and teaching them violence from the Quran and the Hadith? How many Friday sermons are made against the West, freedom and democracy? How many Islamic schools are producing generations of teachers and students who believe in jihad and martyrdom and fighting the infidels? And finally, how many websites are funded by governments, your allies, that have sheikhs or issue fatwas against basic human rights? If you want to fight terrorism, start from there. By the way, I do not give my full name because Islam is a religion of peace. I'm known around the whole world as Brother Rashid, and I implore you to take a stand for international human rights and the future of democracy and speak the truth about the real threat that is facing all of us. Best regards, Brother Rashid. President Obama yesterday said he wanted to reduce ISIS to a manageable problem. Hours later, his vice president, Joe Biden, appeared to give a very different message. We will follow them to the gates of hell until they are brought to justice. Because hell is where they will reside. Hell is where they will reside. Meantime, our own Brett Baer reported that he is receiving feedback from troops, uh, a, a special ops person who has connections with troops on the ground, who say, quote, frustration and confusion reign right now. That their commander-in-chief has deployed them back into harm's way with a defensive mission to only defend U.S. facilities against ISIS. That's not a U.S. problem to solve, and the Iraqis must get their act together politically. Joining me now, retired four-star General Jack Keane, who's a former Army Vice Chief of Staff and Chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. That's a nonpartisan independent group that works with the government on how to respond to threats and executing military operations. General, good to see you. So the troops in Iraq are frustrated, some expressing frustration uh, with the president. Why? Well, first of all, when troops deploy overseas, they always feel good about it. Morale's high, and they want to get something done, and they know they've what they've done in the past. They have a sense of an accomplishment and achievement. But you put your finger on it, they've been given essentially defensive missions without a goal. Uh, so, you know, we're protecting facilities. Even our air forces um, are doing largely defensive air attacks to protect critical infrastructure, to protect Erbil as opposed to doing a very aggressive and comprehensive air campaign throughout Iraq and Syria. So that, over time, that leads to frustration because they start saying to themselves, well, what am I doing here? And, and the great thing about our troops is, you know, they're, they're loyal, they're disciplined, they're courageous, and they're, they're also very thoughtful. And, and you as a collective group they're quite amazing and they're certainly not robotic you know so american troops they speak their mind and they will speak their mind to their, their leaders and, and our, as a leader myself we never looked on it as disloyalty they're just they are americans and they speak and they think 
and we react to that. Yeah. So that's what's taking place here. It's and, a sense and, of and unlike the rest of us, not you, but people like me, they actually have to do it. I mean, they're the ones who actually have to go in and take care of these barbarians uh, when given the order. But let me ask you about this, because the messaging between the commander-in-chief and his vice president was very different yesterday. And it seems like, according to this quote, uh, they don't really believe the vice president. They, they believe the president, who thinks, you know, well, maybe we can manage it. We'll see. And they don't really believe vice president. President Biden with, we'll follow them to the gates of hell. The quote given was, uh, chase them to the gates of hell. How the blank are we going to do that when we can't even leave the front gate of our base? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, uh, they're seeing the pattern. They, they, they certainly are involved in the world. Many of them have been there multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan. So they, they have seen the pattern of behavior by, by the president escalating the war in Afghanistan at the same time making a decision of when we're going to get out and telling our enemies that and, and tying General Petraeus' uh, hand behind his back, pulling the troops out in 2011, not responding to the requests of, of his Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State and Director of the CIA to arm and train the Free Syrian Army in 2012, and then not responding to the chemical attack and with airstrikes. They've seen that entire pattern and they know that no action has had consequences and those consequences are adverse and now we're staring right in the face of those consequences and it's ISIS and it's threat it's attacking our vital interests in the Middle East and certainly it's going to be a threat to the United States mm. unequivocally so. General Jack Keane, good to see you sir. A developing story tonight out of Iraq, President Obama addressing the United States today saying there's no solution to Iraq's problems. The president's remarks come as the U.S. is stepping up military assistance to the country. Now, many have heard of the terrorist group ISIS, but have you ever heard of the terrorist group ISIL? Well, WHSC's Emily Sporn is here to explain the difference. Emily? ISIS and ISIL are actually one and the same, but which acronym you see depends on which departments use them. Think CIA, FBI, etc. This could make a big difference. ISIS actually refers to the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and ISIL is the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Most media outlets identify the terrorist group as ISIS when it first emerged as a force to be reckoned with two years ago in Syria. Since then, it's made its murderous intentions painfully clear and has proven in town after town that it will force people to convert to Islam or it will kill them in droves that are now being called genocidal. So let's break down the key times when you will hear the acronym change there. Here are some key differences to look for between ISIS and ISIL. ISIS is the change in name. This group originally called themselves ISIL and ISIS was the name media outlets started using when the group expanded throughout Syria as well. Now ISIL is the acronym that's now used by agencies like the UN, US State Department, and President Obama. ISIL is also used to refer to the older regions of Iraq or simply areas such as Mesopotamia when Iraq was referred to that. Now, if you go to our website, you can learn more about this breakdown between ISIS and ISIL in the Web Center. Emily Sporn, WHSV. Fox News strategic analyst. Uh, Ralph, the president's messaging was all over the board today on this. And meantime, his counterterrorism head, his defense secretary, his chairman of the Joint Chiefs all seem to be telling us the same thing, which is, yes, we do need to worry. Well, Megan, I believe the president has isolated himself from his own allies at this point. For the intelligence community, sort of a final straw was when he tried to blame them for not alerting him about ISIS. Mm -hmm. When the intelligence community knows full well, it's been doing all it could for well over a year to tell the president that, hey, they're coming and they're serious. And even Chuck Hagel, who's certainly been, um, when not a cipher, very loyal to Obama, he clearly gets it. Uh, throughout the government, you've got people that see this as a very serious threat. They're trying to be loyal to the president, but they're finding they just can't be because this guy doesn't get it. And, you know, today was another debacle where he, he, he said, uh, Obama sounds strong, and then he backs off and says, well, we just got to get this to a manageable level with Islamic State right. Caliphate. You know, that, you can't manage hardcore fanatical terrorists. 
it's like trying to manage a barrel of rattlesnakes, for God's sakes. And then, God help us, you had Joe Biden ranting about how we'll follow ISIS to the gates of hell. We won't even cross the border into Syria. And this is an administration <laughs> that, that, that relies on rhetoric for everything. And, Megan, you know, it struck me today that, there, that one thing, um, President Obama and Vladimir Putin do have one thing in common. You can't pay any attention to what they say, watch what they do, or, in our president's case, what he fails to do. Here's the thing that I think concerns a lot of Americans. Uh, the messaging, it's all over the board. That's clear. They, they give us a different message every day, and it depends on who, even the president is giving us a different message every day. But his counterterrorism officials and those who are supposed to be keeping us safe, they seem to be sticking to... Be concerned. Be very concerned. Then we see them get woodshedded a little bit behind you know, closed doors by the White House, and they come out, they soften it a little, and then they once again go back to what appears to be their truth, which is be concerned. The, the thing that I think a lot of Americans are worried about, Ralph, is what is the truth? I mean, we're coming up on the 9-11, you know, the 13-year mark from the 9-11 from, from attacks. What is the truth? And does the president have a truth that he believes about this group? Well... That's the, the last question you ask is impossible for us to know because none of us can really get inside this president's head. He he appear. I mean, my personal view is that he has a deep psychological aversion to bearing responsibility to making any decisions. But as far as what's the truth about ISIS and the threat on the anniversary of 9/11, what we do know is they want desperately to hit us. Islamist terrorists all want to hit us and there's no better day than the anniversary of 9-11. On the other hand, our, you know, our government doesn't get credit when it does deserve it. Uh, our counter-terrorist forces um, are elements from Homeland Security, the intelligence community, to New York City cops have done a remarkable job of keeping us safe. But the threat is growing. It is metastasizing and our president is doing nothing and at some point even the best e efforts of New York's finest are not going to be able to prevent that horrible attack. Ralph, thank you. Also My fellow Americans, tonight I want to speak to you about what the United States will do with our friends and allies to degrade and ultimately destroy the terrorist group known as ISIL. As Commander-in-Chief, my highest priority is the security of the American people. Over the last several years, we have consistently taken the fight to terrorists who threaten our country. We took out Osama bin Laden and much of al-Qaeda's leadership in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We've targeted al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen and recently eliminated the top commander of its affiliate in Somalia. We've done so while bringing more than 140,000 American troops home from Iraq and drawing down our forces in Afghanistan, where our combat mission will end later this year. Thanks to our military and counterterrorism professionals, America is safer. Still, we continue to face a terrorist threat. We can't erase every trace of evil from the world, and small groups of killers have the capacity to do great harm. That was the case before 9-11, and that remains true today. And that's why we must remain vigilant as threats emerge. At this moment, the greatest threats come from the Middle East and North Africa, where radical groups exploit grievances for their own gain. And one of those groups is ISIL, which calls itself the Islamic State. Now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents, and the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain territory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. It is recognized by no government nor by the people it subjugates. ISIL is a terrorist organization, pure and simple, and it has no vision other than the slaughter of all who stand in its way. In a region that has known so much bloodshed, these terrorists are unique in their brutality. They execute captured prisoners. They kill children. They enslave, rape, and force women into marriage. They threaten the religious minority with genocide. 
and in acts of barbarism. They took the lives of two American journalists, Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. So ISIL poses a threat to the people of Iraq and Syria and the broader Middle East, including American citizens, personnel, and facilities. If left unchecked, these terrorists could pose a growing threat beyond that region, including to the United States. While we have not yet detected specific plotting against our homeland, ISIL leaders have threatened America and our allies. Our intelligence community believes that thousands of foreigners, including Europeans and some Americans, have joined them in Syria and Iraq. Trained and battle-hardened, these fighters could try to return to their home countries and carry out deadly attacks. I know many Americans are concerned about these threats. Tonight, I want you to know that the United States of America is meeting them with strength and resolve. Last month, I ordered our military to take targeted action against ISIL to stop its advances. Since then, we've conducted more than 150 successful airstrikes in Iraq. These strikes have protected American personnel and facilities, killed ISIL fighters, destroyed weapons, and given space for Iraqi and Kurdish forces to reclaim key territory. These strikes have also helped save the lives of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. But this is not our fight alone. American power can make a decisive difference, but we cannot do for Iraqis what they must do for themselves. Nor can we take the place of Arab partners in securing their region. And that's why I've insisted that additional U.S. action depended upon Iraqis forming an inclusive government, which they have now done in recent days. So tonight, with a new Iraqi government in place, and following consultations with allies abroad and Congress at home, I can announce that America will lead a broad coalition to roll back this terrorist threat. Our objective is clear. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. First, we will conduct a systematic campaign of airstrikes against these terrorists. Working with the Iraqi government, we will expand our efforts beyond protecting our own people and humanitarian missions so that we're hitting ISIL targets as Iraqi forces go on offense. Moreover, I've made it clear that we will hunt down terrorists who threaten our country wherever they are. That means I will not hesitate to take action against ISIL in Syria as well as Iraq. This is a core principle of my presidency. If you threaten America, you will find no safe haven. Second, we will increase our support to forces fighting these terrorists on the ground. In June, I deployed several hundred American service members to Iraq to assess how we can best support Iraqi security forces. Now that those teams have completed their work and Iraq has formed a government, we will send an additional 475 service members to Iraq. As I've said before, these American forces will not have a combat mission. We will not get dragged into another ground war in Iraq. But they are needed to support Iraqi and Kurdish forces with training, intelligence, and equipment. We'll also support Iraq's efforts to stand up National Guard units to help Sunni communities secure their own freedom from ISIL's control. Across the border in Syria, we have ramped up our military assistance to the Syrian opposition. Tonight, I call on Congress again to give us additional authorities and resources to train and equip these fighters. In the fight against ISIL, we cannot rely on an Assad regime that terrorizes its own people, a regime that will never regain the legitimacy it has lost. Instead, we must strengthen the opposition as the best counterweight to extremists like ISIL, while pursuing the political solution necessary to solve Syria's crisis once and for all. Third, we will continue to draw on our substantial counterterrorism capabilities to prevent ISIL attacks. Working with our partners, we will redouble our efforts to cut off its funding, improve our intelligence, strengthen our defenses, counter its warped ideology, and stem the flow of foreign fighters into and out of the Middle East. And in two weeks, I will chair a meeting of the UN Security Council to further mobilize the international community around this effort. Fourth, 
we will continue to provide humanitarian assistance to innocent civilians who've been displaced by this terrorist organization. This includes Sunni and Shia Muslims who are at grave risk, as well as tens of thousands of Christians and other religious minorities. We cannot allow these communities to be driven from their ancient homelands. So this is our strategy. And in each of these four parts of our strategy, America will be joined by a broad coalition of partners. Already, allies are flying planes with us over Iraq, sending arms and assistance to Iraqi security forces and the Syrian opposition, sharing intelligence and providing billions of dollars in humanitarian aid. Secretary Kerry was in Iraq today, meeting with the new government and supporting their efforts to promote unity. And in the coming days, he will travel across the Middle East and Europe to enlist more partners in this fight, especially Arab nations who can help mobilize Sunni communities in Iraq and Syria to drive these terrorists from their lands. This is American leadership at its best. We stand with people who fight for their own freedom, and we rally other nations on behalf of our common security and common humanity. My administration has also secured bipartisan support for this approach here at home. I have the authority to address the threat from ISIL, but I believe we are strongest as a nation when the President and Congress work together. So I welcome congressional support for this effort in order to show the world that Americans are united in confronting this danger. Now, it will take time to eradicate a cancer like ISIL. And any time we take military action, there are risks involved, especially to the servicemen and women who carry out these missions. But I want the American people to understand how this effort will be different from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It will not involve American combat troops fighting on foreign soil. This counterterrorism campaign will be waged through a steady, relentless effort to take out ISIL wherever they exist using our air power and our support for partners' forces on the ground. This strategy of taking out terrorists who threaten us while supporting partners on the front lines is one that we have successfully pursued in Yemen and Somalia for years, and it is consistent with the approach I outlined earlier this year, to use force against anyone who threatens America's core interests, but to mobilize partners wherever possible to address broader challenges to international order. My fellow Americans, we live in a time of great change. Tomorrow marks 13 years since our country was attacked. Next week marks six years since our economy suffered its worst setback since the Great Depression. Yet, despite these shocks, through the pain we felt and the grueling work required to bounce back, America is better positioned today to seize the future than any other nation on Earth. Our technology companies and universities are unmatched. Our manufacturing and auto industries are thriving. Energy independence is closer than it's been in decades. For all the work that remains, our businesses are in the longest uninterrupted stretch of job creation in our history. Despite all the divisions and discord within our democracy, I see the grit and determination and common goodness of the American people every single day. And that makes me more confident than ever about our country's future. A broad American leadership is the one constant in an uncertain world. It is America that has the capacity and the will to mobilize the world against terrorists. It is America that has rallied the world against Russian aggression and in support of the Ukrainian people's right to determine their own destiny. It is America, our scientists, our doctors, our know-how, they can help contain and cure the outbreak of Ebola. It is America that helped remove and destroy Syria's declared chemical weapons so that they can't pose a threat to the Syrian people or the world again. And it is America that is helping Muslim communities around the world, not just in the fight against terrorism, but in the fight for opportunity and tolerance and a more hopeful future. America, our endless blessings bestow an enduring burden. But as Americans, we welcome our responsibility to lead. From Europe to Asia, from the far reaches of Africa to war-torn capitals of the Middle East, we stand for freedom, for justice, 
for dignity. These are values that have guided our nation since its founding. Tonight, I ask for your support in carrying that leadership forward. I do so as a Commander-in-Chief who could not be prouder of our men and women in uniform. Pilots who bravely fly in the face of danger above the Middle East, and service members who support our partners on the ground. When we helped prevent the massacre of civilians trapped on a distant mountain, here's what one of them said. We owe our American friends our lives. Our children will always remember that there was someone who felt our struggle and made a long journey to protect innocent people. That is the difference we make in the world. And our own safety, our own security, depends upon our willingness to do what it takes to defend this nation and uphold the values that we stand for. Timeless ideals that will endure long after those who offer only hate and destruction have been vanquished from the earth. May God bless our troops, and may God bless the United States of America. The air campaign against Syria is already in serious trouble before it even begins. Congressional sources tell the Kelly file tonight the president may not be able to fund this war due to doubts about the mission. This as we learn that the broad coalition the president promised is apparently anything but. Welcome to the Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megyn Kelly. It is less than 48 hours since President Obama rolled out his plan for taking on the terror army known as the Islamic State. And we are seeing significant problems already with the president's plan. First, reports of growing uneasiness on Capitol Hill about backing the president's war plans. Both dovish Democrats and even some hawkish Republicans are saying a likely vote on funding this next week could be tougher than first expected due to doubts about the strategy. Next, the New York Times reported that the Arab governments in this region have given at best tepid support to the U.S. plan. Egypt says it's busy with its own problems. Jordan claims the same. Turkey says not to expect its support. Saudi Arabia may let us use Arab bases, but maybe not. Even our European allies are far from reliable partners here. Germany already said no to airstrikes. And the UK said no, too. And then when pressed, threw us a bone of, well, maybe. On top of that, the Washington Post reported today that President Obama has rejected what was characterized as the best military advice from Central Command on how to win this fight. The top general in CENTCOM, that's who oversees this region, reportedly advised sending a modest group of American special forces to help guide the Iraqi military as it takes on ISIS, which the president turned down cold. So where does that leave us? Joining me now, Charles Krauthammer, a syndicated columnist, Fox News contributor, and author of Things That Matter, which just hit over a million copies sold. Charles, good to see you tonight. And so wh which of those many problems is the biggest one in pursuing this strategy? Well, I think the entire strategy, which stands on these three legs, is really in trouble. He can't get c congressional support. I suspect in the end, if he makes uh, sort of an ultimatum, Congress is not going to want it to deny the president. But you can see how weak his support is. And the fact that he isn't asking for authorization is because Democrats in Congress, especially those who are running for election, are begging him not to make them cast a vote in favor of war. That's how tepid is his support there. The real issue among the allies, a so-called broad coalition, mm -hmm. which is a complete farce and fiction, is Turkey. Turkey is right next door to Syria. If you had an air campaign, you want to have it come out of Turkish air bases, and in fact, Turkey is a part of NATO. Turkey has said no, no use of the air bases. They are not on the fence. Which, and and the, that, that was probably the most important element in this whole thing. And the, the last element you mentioned, I think, is perhaps the most important. Obama said we have to imitate what we did in Somalia and Yemen, which is quite ridiculous. Somalia, we've had two airstrikes all year. He's going to defeat ISIS, which his own administration is calling a threat unlike any we've ever seen, with two airstrikes, drone strikes. That doesn't apply. The only thing that applies is the initial campaign against Afghanistan 13 years ago. And that was a small contingent of special ops on the ground who guided in the bombers, 
the plains above, that was us, and worked in coordination with the local troops, the Northern Alliance. Within a hundred days, the Taliban government had been destroyed and defeated. That's the only thing that's going to work with ISIS. And if Obama turned down the plan, the plan you mentioned is the one that most imitates Afghanistan. Special ops on the ground, American airplanes in the air, local infantry. If he turned it down, that does not bode well. How are we going to do this if Secretary Kerry, who's now trying to, you know, gin up support and is suggesting that not to worry, I've got some sort of support from 40 countries, but we don't know what it looks like yet. But, but if he doesn't gin up actual military support for the U.S., how are we going to get this done? We can't. And that's what makes the boast that the president had to we're going to lead a broad coalition. Yeah, a broad coalition of countries holding our coats and, if, and issuing statements. You remember how Democrats ridiculed George W. because he went in alone into Iraq? According to the U.S. Army, the Center of Military History, George W. had 38 allies with boots on the ground, amounting to more than 25,000 allies on the ground with us. Obama, as of today, has zero, and there are very few prospects of any allies contributing anybody on the ground, and thus far we haven't heard of anybody even helping us in the air. When you talk about the U.K., saying, no, we are not going to help with the airstrikes. And then David Cameron walked that back to, well, maybe. But the U.K. isn't even going to help us, Charles. I mean, the, the prospects don't look very good for help. And that, I think, the U.K., as you say, really is the litmus test. They were with us in Afghanistan. They were with us in Iraq, thick and thin, when things were really bad. Why not and now? And here they are. Well, I think the real issue here is this. You've got a president who's ambivalent, president who clearly is reluctant, a president who obviously does not want to do this, a president who took us into Afghanistan with the surge, tripling the number of troops, and he's in Afghanistan, he decides to go for it, and in the same sentence where he announces the surge, he announces a withdrawal date, which totally demoralizes our allies. I, a, a, a president who goes into Libya leading from behind and then leaves immediately and it, it falls into chaos. They see a president who does not commit himself to win or to succeed, only to go in and to get out. And if you have to command your armies, whether it's a British Air Force, a Turkish Air Force, or any of the allies on the ground in the region, you say to yourself, am I going to follow this man into battle? risk my troops and my support at home for a man who clearly is not committed to this, that's the issue. It's a lack of confidence in the president who draws a red line, then walks away and pretends he never drew the red line at all. And then if we go over there, essentially by ourselves, without serious support from any Muslim country, are we stirring up the same hornet's nests or more hornet's nests than we started with? I mean, this is so bad that it's become the fodder for comics, including those who are normally very supportive of President Obama. I give you the following example from Jon Stewart. I'm gonna need to see this on the big board. Is that, ah, okay. That looks awful Christian-y. <laughs> got a <clears throat> little bit of a crusady vibe. Um, I hesitate to ask this, but can a brother get an ottoman up in this bitch? It only officially includes one Muslim nation, Turkey. <laughs> we only needed one, baby. Cover supplied. Any suggestion that Turkey is well on board for any sort of military action may be a problem for uh, Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, but the point is well taken, is it not? Look, I suspect that what will happen is this. We do have allies on the ground, namely the, the Kurds, for whom it's a real fight for, the, for their own lives. And they do have a good record of fighting. Some Iraqi units, we can't depend on the Iraqi army in general, but we will now begin to have some influence with our advisors. And what remains 
of the secular Syrian opposition. Mm -hmm. It isn't a lot because Obama waited three years. We do have allies on the ground. I don't think it's enough, and I think the military will tell okay. you it isn't enough for, to win, but perhaps to, to, to contain them. Last, last question. Given the problems we've just discussed, is there any chance the president does now what he did a year ago and find some way to reverse course on this? He can't. If he did that, it would lead to such a collapse of confidence in the U.S. It would be a catastrophe. It would take years for America to recover. His presidency would be over, and he'd become a laughingstock. He can't do that. What I think he will do is a limited operation with some of the allies, meaning the locals, on the ground and try to hold, uh, hold back ISIS for a couple of years until he leaves office and ends up re retiring to the golf course. Fox News alert, another American journalist beheaded by ISIS, and this morning President Obama is speaking out for the first time in Estonia. It's not only that we're going to be bringing to justice those who perpetrated this terrible crime against these two uh, fine young men. Uh, more broadly, the United States will continue to lead continue to lead, but has the president been leading at all? Iraq war veteran and Congressman Adam Kinzinger joins us right now from Washington, D.C. Congressman, you actually have been more of a leader on this. Back in January, you were calling for airstrikes on ISIS. The president didn't do that until the last couple of weeks. No, you know, this is uh, this has been growing for a very long time. There's still, I think, parts of the administration that like to act as if this is something brand new that, you know, with the beheading of James Foley, it's the first time we've heard about this. This has been going on for a long time. In fact, the Iraqi government asked the Washington for some help in trying to resist this resurgence a year ago. And uh, we saw in January when what appeared to be Al Qaeda, but actually ended up being ISIS, marched into Fallujah and raised the black flag over Fallujah. That was the time to stop them. There were 1,500 of them then. Today we're in the 20, 30,000 range, including 1,500 foreign fighters. And guess what? If we don't do anything major sure. now, it's going to double and triple in the, in the near future. Uh, absolutely. The president last week, and I'm sure your jaw dropped, just as many did, when he said, we don't have a strategy when it comes to right. ISIS. Well, this morning he essentially said, well, we do have a strategy. It's to destroy ISIS. And then he uh, continued on for a little while, and then he said, uh, well, actually the goal is to manage ISIS. Which is it? Is it destroy or manage? Can you do both? I think that's the big question. Are we going to contain ISIS or are we going to crush ISIS? And the president has not answered that. I think he's so hesitant to get involved with something, he's so hesitant to exercise American leadership that you see somebody like Prime Minister David Cameron out, you know, exercising that kind of strength of leadership that I'm glad he's doing, but our president should be doing as well. He needs to stand in front of the American people, quit using words like take a deep look, take a gander, figure out what's, and start talking about what the issue is. Look, if you have cancer in your liver and it's spreading to other parts of your body, you don't just treat the parts it's spreading to, you have to treat the liver or this thing's going to kill you eventually. He needs to stand in front with that kind of clarity and say, look, I, no, nobody wants to get us into another military action, but unfortunately we can't choose the world we live in, and this is the world that we live in right now. And to your point about the, the, that clarity and the president's leadership, we had on this program the Vaughn family. They lost their son, who was in SEAL Team 6 a while back. They're, they're furious at the president. Uh, they, they say he should resign because of, among other things, this. Listen. Right now, today, ISIS is a threat, Russia is a threat, China is a threat, but I will tell you today, the greatest security threat the United States of America faces resides at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., by this president not having his head in the game. So they say the president not focused. Well, I don't think the president is focused, and of course my heart goes out to that family. I just, you know, I think he's more focused on what he wants to do domestically. Uh, I think he's he, he wants to fix the problems, what he perceives in sure. America, and, uh, and it's time for him to fix the problems of the world. America is a fantastic country. Are we perfect? Of course not. Right. But if we're not leading the world, somebody else is, and we've seen what that looks like. It ain't good. Real quick before you go, why won't the Pentagon call this a war on ISIS? Because they're at war with us. Look, the Pentagon has to answer to the president, and I think they've been very clear that we need to go into Syria as close as they can be, but ultimately they have to answer to the president. The president doesn't call it a war, they won't either. He is the commander-in-chief. All right. That's uh, right. Adam Kinzinger, a vet, we thank you very much for joining us live. Thank you very much. You bet. All right, 20 minutes after the top of the hour. He's lost two...
everyone. Shalom. Welcome. This is another Martis Ministry Prophecy in the News Update. And we have been sharing about the Al-Mahdi of Islam, which is the Biblical Antichrist. And we've been sharing how, how Obama has been fulfilling that role. And it's very important to look at his loyalty towards Islam. And we've been sharing that. And there's a lot more very important relevant information regarding that that needs to, to be shared, inclu including the prisoner swap, which will be covered. And there's going to be a, a small bit of other news as well regarding the Pope and the interfaith thing that went down in, in the Vatican and um, some other things. But this is very important to look at because if we look at the Antichrist in Scripture, definitely his role is for persecuting Christians. We see in Revelation 13, 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. We see that the ultimate fruition of that uh, of the overcoming of saints occurs mid-tribulation. But we see a lot of stuff warming up. We also see persecution, a uh, spe very specific type of persecution of Christians mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So it's talking about these martyrs specifically being uh, beheaded, beheading, and that's very specific to Islam. That's because this, this persecution of Christians is through Islam. You see that the more the rise of Islam, the more the persecution of Christians. It's, it's, uh, it's the way that it's been going, and we see every single day more and more of that happening and Christians being killed uh, around the world. So, and, and, and this is the thing, that Obama's role in, in helping Islam to grow has just been enormous uh, in so many ways. And so that's really showing his tr true colors of, his, of the Al-Mahdi, which is a political world leader that brings, quote-unquote, justice to the world for Islam, of course. So um, look at his actions, and they speak volumes, which is why this is very important to look. We're going to be looking at the last few months as it relates to uh, Syria, Iraq, and, and Afghanistan. And there's lots of developments. So starting with Syria, we understand that it's, there's a lot going on there. And Syria is very specific in Islamic eschatology uh, for being a very important, significant uh, place. And so we see that on both sides of Shiites and, Muslim, and Sunnis. So right here it says in, from Reuters.com, April 1st, it explains this, apocalyptic prophecies drive both sides to Syrian battle for end of time. Iranian forces battle anti-Shiite fighters in Damascus and the region braces for an ultimate showdown. It goes on, it resonates even more with the Sunni and Shiite fighters on the front lines who believe it was all foretold in 7th century prophecies. Clearly, Syria, very important for the, both the Shiites and the Sunnis regarding their prophecies. So we have to look at what's going in Syria is very uh, important as it relates to Obama for sure. Now this, this next article here, just four months back, we're looking at, at an overview of certain things. Okay, this is February 3rd, uh, 2014, from examiner.com. I'm going to read a good portion of this very important information. It says here, Top Islamic cleric calls on Obama administration to wage jihad for Allah. A top Islamic cleric, Dr. Yusuf al Qaradawi, is seen in a video calling on the U.S., i.e. the Obama administration, to wage jihad for Allah in Syria. This video is currently making its rounds on Arabic media and Facebook. Qaradawi is said to be one of the most influential Islamic clerics in the world. He is considered a spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
It goes on. In the video, supposedly he thanks the U.S. for supporting the freedom fighters, quote unquote. In Syria, he added that, quote, Allah willing, your aid will increase. End of quote. Quote, we want America to take a manly stand, a stand for Allah. End of quote. In other words, he's calling on the U.S. to strike Syria Bashar Assad's government. Raymond Ibrahim wrote an op-ed for the Christian Post that Karadawi is calling it a, quote, stand for Allah. He's basically calling on the U.S. to fight, quote, in the cause of Allah. Sheikh Karadawi is allegedly one of the greatest minds of Islam and a strong supporter of jihad. He has issued fatwas in the past with orders to kill and destroy infidels. It goes on, the whole world could say the current administration seems to be working with the, quote, global Islamist movement, end of quote, in taking a, quote, stand for Allah, end of quote. It goes on, it's widely known that all the nations where the U.S. has intervened have become more radical and hostile to non-Muslims. Claire Lopez of the Gallstone Institute summarized that the U.S. seems to be taking its cue from Karadawi. She says some important things here. She said, quote, The current administration consistently and repeatedly appeared to respond eagerly to the calls for revolution from the Muslim Brotherhood senior Islamic scholar Yusuf al-Karadawi. When al-Karadawi said that Mubarak had to go, the U.S. waited a whole three days before throwing America's key ally in the Middle East for over three decades under the bus. When al-Karadawi called for Libyan rebels to kill Muhammad al-Gaddafi so the al-Qaeda jihadists in, in his jails could get out and join the revolution, the U.S. led the Western military campaign that brought al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, and chaos to Libya. Lopez continued with her summarization, saying, quote, And when al-Qaradawi issued a call for jihad in Syria in early June 2013, the U.S. quickly issued an invitation to Abdullah bin Baya, al-Qaradawi's vice president at the International Union of Muslim Scholars, who told an Al Jazeera reporter that, quote, We demand Washington take a greater role in Syria, end of quote. It took the U.S. less than one week after Qardawi's fatwa to announce authorization of stepped-up military aid to the Al-Qaeda's and, Mus and Brotherhood-dominated Syrian rebels. The White House announcement came just a single day after Bin Baya met with National Security and other senior administration officials. End of quote. The article says, Is the U.S. actually working? Quote, in the cause of Allah, end of quote. And the answer is yes. There's so many friends, that's a great summary of, of what uh, the administration has been doing. And it brings us to, to more recent news regarding Syria. It says, June 8th here from RT.com, U.S. admits sending lethal aid to Syrian rebels. And it talks about Susan Rice, and it's giving her quote here that says, The single largest contributor of humanitarian assistance, providing over $1.7 billion in assistance. Okay, she goes on to say, That's why the United States has ramped up its support for the moderate, moderate vetted opposition, providing lethal and non-lethal support where we can to support both the civilian opposition and the military opposition, she said. Okay, this is important. Talking about Syria here, she goes on, media reports, however, suggested that the CIA was secretly involved in training rebel groups and assisting Saudi Arabia and Qatar in smuggling arms to the rebels fighting to topple Syrian President Bashar Assad. Rice emphasized Washington's desire to play a more active role in the Syrian conflict by getting co Congress approval for more assistance to the rebels. More assistance to the rebels. Remember Karadawi said, Allah willing, your aid will increase. And they're looking to continually increase that aid and they are giving lethal aid. So this is, this is very important, um, Syria. This is the major place of, of the apocalyptic uh, scenarios that are, that are in the uh, deceptive Islamic prophecy. 
So we look at, which is engineered. The prophecy is engineered for, for deception. It's just not tr truth at all. And so we look at Obama's role. It's so clear in what he's doing. And you see Qardawi saying, Allah willing, your aid will increase. He's, he's going forth with that. But Qardawi's not the only one saying that phrase, Allah willing. It comes from Obama himself using that phrase. This is an important article here from cnsnews.com. Just April 27th, Imam to Obama, end of end oppression of Muslims. Obama to Imam, pray for me. Visiting Malaysia's National Mosque on Sunday, President Obama was asked by the institution's Imam to end oppression against Muslims worldwide. Before I go on, that is the job of the Mahdi. That is what the Mahdi does. Okay, he's, he's asking for the ending of oppression for Muslims worldwide. Okay, it goes on Malaysia's National Press Agency, Bernama reported, Pray for me, Obama replied, according to Grand Imam Ismail Mohammed, who took him on a 25-minute tour of the mosque called Masjid Nigara in Malay in Kuala Lumpur goes on, the 70-year-old cleric said Obama had frequently replied with insya Allah, Malay for Allah willing. He's saying the very phrases himself. It goes on, Malaysia's star newspaper quoted Abdullah Muhammad Zin, religious advisor to a prime minister Najib Razak, as saying it was not common for a leader of a superpower to include a visit to a mosque in his itinerary. He says, there can be no better way for Obama to honor Islam than by visiting Masjid Nigara. He said, yes, he's honoring Islam. He's talking about Allah willing when asked to end the oppression of Muslims worldwide. And he asked for prayer for that. This is absolutely outrageous, unbelievable, yet believable at the same time. So that's in Syria. It's, it's constantly going on. Wars, war, rumors of wars going on in Syria. Then we look at Iraq now. So the Iraqi government is Shiite run. It's mainly Shiite. There's a small percentage of Sunnis in there, but it's mainly Shiite. And since the U.S. withdrew from Iraq back in, what was it, 2011, the the government has been increasingly excluding Sunnis and persecuting Sunnis, actually. And so Sunni and other anti-Shiite Islamists are with, with a caliphate agenda are now upset. They've been taking over Iraqi cities by a storm. In Mosul, 500,000 fleed um, for their lives. And we have major activity going on in Iraq right now. I mean, there's reports of beheadings. They're coming in, taking over all kinds of infrastructure, weapons, um, hospitals, and they even uh, the ISIS militants, okay, which is also a, a, ISIS and ISIL are one and the same, just very slight difference there, but they're the same group. Uh, ISIS militants went and bulldozed a divide between Iraq and Syria symbolically to show that um, they, they want to have a caliphate together. Okay, so this is all very significant. And ISIS says that there's going to be more. June 12th, just two, 2014, CNN.com, rec recording. ISIS promised more fighting in Iraq more Iraqi cities. So they're promising that this is going to continue. They're not stopping there. They have a bigger agenda in mind. In fact, they're not going to stop. They don't want to stop till they get till Jer to Jerusalem to establish um, you know, Jerusalem as their caliphate capital. But so they're just trying to expand more and more. And you know, they're including what they're doing is they're trying to use water uh, accessibility as a, one of their ways to, to attack the Shiites. Sunni and other anti-Shiite Islamists are working to keep the water supply away from the Shiite, Shiites that support the government. It says here, english.globalarabnetwork.com, June 9th, 2014, threat of disease in Iraq villages flooded by militants. Analyst told Iran, Iran, ISIL's primary intention was to cut off water supplies to the south of the country, where the population is largely Shiite and sympathetic to the government. 
Okay, so that's one of the things that they're doing. And all of this is going on. Shiites are getting upset and they're ready to go fight back as well. Iraqi Shiite cleric issues call to arms against Sunni militants. This is June 13th from New York Times. So they're, they're wanting to fight back. This is just escalating into more wars and rumors of wars uh, that, that they're preparing for and what is going down right now in Iraq. Okay, so we look at this, and where's Obama in, in all of this? Very important article here. This is from dailymail.co.uk, June 13th. Revealed how Obama set free the merciless terrorist warlord now leading the ISIS horde blazing a trail of destruction through Iraq. The United States once had Islamic State of Iraq and al-Shams, ISIS, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in custody at a detention facility in Iraq. But President Barack Obama let him go. It was revealed on Friday. Al-Baghdadi was among the prisoners released in 2009 from the U.S.'s now-closed Camp Bukha near Umm Qasr in Iraq. But now, five years later, he is leading the army of ruthless extremists bearing down on Baghdad who want to turn the country into an Islamist state by blazing a bloody trail through towns and cities, executing Iraqi soldiers, beheading police officers, and gunning down innocent civilians. A lot of things to note there. You can check out the entire article. The archive will be available. Um, you can check the description box for the link to that. This is all very important to see why he was letting this man go. And the, the article says it's unclear. It's mysterious why he would let this man go. Okay, and it also talks about beheading here. Beheadings that are going on right now, which we talked about in the, in the beginning of um, the video. So that's very specific to Islam. And Obama's role is huge. He keeps on showing who he's really supporting, his true colors. You know, um, his, he's very strategic in timing of everything. That he set, he, uh, set that prisoner uh, free in 2009. 2011, as I mentioned, uh, the last U.S. troops uh, left and, you know, left the place with political uncertainty. And so... We look at um, his actions over and over again, who he meets with, what he's doing, and it's just extremely shocking and revealing. We see February 5th, just not too long ago, this is all information that's relatively new, we see from freebeacon.com, Muslim Brotherhood leader meets Obama in White House. And this meeting is very important as it relates to Iraq, actually. It says, controversial British Muslim Brotherhood leader participates in Iraq discussion. A senior member of the Muslim Brotherhood was recently hosted at the White House for a meeting with President Barack Obama, prompting an outcry from critics of the global Islamist organization. Anas Altikriti, a top British lobbyist for the Muslim Brotherhood, whose father heads Iraq's Muslim Brotherhood Party recently met with the President and Vice President Joe Biden as a part of delegation discussing, discussing problems in Iraq. Okay? This is very important because the man, Osama Taf uh, Tafik Al Tikriti, the father of Anis Al Tikriti, leads the largest Sunni Islamist political party in Iraq totally Muslim Brotherhood, okay? His son is meeting with Obama. They're talking about Iraq. They're Sunni. They're anti-Shiite, okay? Obviously anti uh, the government. And so they're discussing Iraq specifically. Just, you know, we see that so recently happening. And so it's really, really important to see who he's talking to, what they're talking about. It even specifies what they're talking about. They're talking about Iraq. And so these are the same people, I mean, they have the same agenda of being anti-Shiite as we see what, everything that's going on in Iraq right now against the, the government. And so there's just so much that's going on in, in the midst of this all. And it's important to, to note that there's infighting among factions. You may think, 
how come a Sunni guy and another Sunni, they, they seem to have the same caliphate forming agenda, but how come they're, you know, killing each other, which we see happening a lot of times. And there's just so much infighting because it's about control. It's ultimately about control of who will lead. And you know, all their loyalty is really only to Satan, who comes to steal, kill, and dis destroy. So for right now, we see a lot of infighting going on, also among those in the same sect. And, and you know, that's when the Mahdi will come in at the right time to unite everybody. But so it shouldn't seem surprising when we see those types of uh, activities, you know, with the infighting. And there's just complicated politics involved in all of this. And we see, so Obama, what is he doing right now? He's, he's contemplating what should be done next in Iraq. June 13th, NewYorkTimes.com, Mr. Obama, he emphasized a long-term failure in Baghdad leaders to achieve political reconciliation across sectarian lines. He warned Iraqi leaders that if they want American help, they have to come up with a plan to accommodate minority factions in a, in a meaningful way. Accommodate minority factions, so he, it's specifically... Minority factions includes, of course, the Sunnis. Okay, that's because the, the, the government is mainly Shiite. And so he's talking about if that happens, then that would be incorporating Tafik al Tikriti's party, the, is, the Iraqi Islamic party. So without saying names, it's very clear who he's implying in this. And, you know. And he just met with that man's son just four months earlier. Okay, and then this is all going down. He says, quote, The United States is not simply going to involve itself in a military action in the absence of a political plan by the Iraqis that gives us some assurance that they are prepared to work together. And of quote, he said. Okay, so he's basically placing the blame on the government in many ways and asking them to incorporate Sunni and anti-Shiite factions. Okay. And so we'll see what he does on this. There's a lot of complicated politics always involved, even in, as I said, uh, even among the same faction. And so, but but all of this put together, what he's saying, the rhetoric he's talking about, you know, um, there's been some talk about within the Congress about regime change, just hinting at that kind of stuff. So his, his colors are really showing here in, in Iraq as well. And, of course, in Afghanistan, which gives us a um, segue into the, the whole thing with the Bergdahl prisoner swap. Okay, so early in June, the, the whole thing happened with um, the, the prisoner swap. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But just to know that May tw 27, 2014, from the New York Times, U.S. troops to leave Afghanistan by end of 2016. So similarly, we have, you know, what happened in Iraq is more, um, we call it extremist activity after the U.S. president, uh, you know, takes away troops. So this is recent news, President Obama declaring that it was time to turn the page on a decade in which so much of our foreign policy was focused on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, announced on Tuesday that he planned to withdraw the last American troops from Afghanistan by the end of 2016. Of course, he did not personally put them there, but his withdrawal in specific timings relating to everything else is what we're looking at. And so, understanding the whole Bergdahl situation, uh, a U.S. soldier that was in captivity with the Taliban, if, if those are, that are not familiar, was swapped out for five Taliban leaders. Okay, But what's important to note is that this is so different than the way that it's being portrayed Bergdahl there was no there was no real prisoner swap Bergdahl was specifically an excuse used to be able to free the, the key Taliban leaders an excuse an excuse to be able to strategically let these guys go these are key players in the Taliban in Afghanistan that were released and so we make it clear in understanding that Islam all around in this whole situation, it was a win-win. So any way you look at it, Islam wins. Okay, And just to understand further about this Taliban in Afghanistan, okay, and, and who they, they really are, you know, you look at this headline from just a few months back. It says, suicide bombing, gunfight as Taliban attack foreign guest house in Kabul. 
It's from RTNews.com. And the Taliban took responsibility for this attack, and they said it was for uh, uh, towards a church and a guest house. Taliban spokesman Zaila Mujadid Mujahid said the church was used by foreigners for converting Afghans to Christianity. Okay, so that's the thing, that's the reason that they went to attack them. So we really get an understanding of what these guys are about, the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? That was in Kabul, which is in um, Afghanistan. So that's what they're about. These are the people that are being released because of the Obama administration. And we look at that man, Bergdahl, and this is what the Taliban say about him. Dailymail.co.uk Openly, Taliban claim captured U.S. soldier has converted to Islam and is teaching its fighters bomb-making skills. And to make everything even more suspicious, his father, as some of you have seen this, his father has gone on television in front of you know the White House with Obama by his side stating Islamic phrases something called the Bismala. Okay? First of all, the Bob Bergdahl, his father, okay, the, the soldier's father, he's been exposed for tweeting to the Taliban about his goal of releasing the all Guantanamo Bay prisoners. Okay? And if that's not enough, he states the Islamic Bismala phrase in Arabic. Okay? It's it's insane. And Obama right next to him smiling. Okay, the Bismala is specific to Islam. It's a phrase recited before each chapter of the Quran, and it's translated as "In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful." Okay, and right when he starts to speak this, you see Obama's face just lights right up, and you have to see it to believe it. I'd like to say to Bo right now, who's having trouble speaking English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Zayabayem. I'm your father, Bo. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Zayabayem. I'm your father, Bo. Okay, so we see right when he says that, Obama's just happy and he's, you know, it's like music to his ears. Is this all not extremely suspicious? Does it not give us an idea of whose loyalty is where? All of this taken together. And to add even more umph, for lack of a better word, to the situation, Afghanistan specifically has a very important role in Islamic prophecy. It's called the Khorasan Qur- Qur- prophecy. Okay, and the Hadith, which is an Islamic text, has has many different um, statings about the about this prophecy. But I'll read this one. The Hadith says. If you see him, give him your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice, because surely he is the Caliph of Allah, the Mahdi. If you see the black, meaning war, flags coming from Khorasan, Afghanistan, join that army, even if you have to crawl over ice, for this is the army of the Caliph, the Mahdi, and no one can stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. Many things to note here. Khorasan is an area, and Afghanistan comprises the majority of that area. So Afghanistan is very important, particular to this prophecy, where they believe the army will be raising the the black flags, okay, and that that's assigned to them, okay, until they reach Jerusalem. Again, that's stated. Jerusalem is key in prophecy. That's why uh, you can check out the last video we um, talked about Abbas clapping when he uh, heard speaking about the jihad of Jerusalem, and he actually clapped to that. Jerusalem is huge. We've been talking about that. Okay? And Afghanistan being such a huge part of this all is critical to understand what's happening, what happened with that Bergdahl uh, prisoner swap. Because the, the, the key players in Afghanistan that want the caliphate and want and, and are, are looking at this prophecy as, as true, wanting to take over Jerusalem, the key players have been released. So who do you think it will be that's going to be helping rise up an army in Afghanistan when, when they do return to Afghanistan to help that come about with the black flags? Who do you think it is? It's certainly going to be these top, top keep uh, Taliban guys, the five. 
So this is very huge and significant to the Khorasan prophecy, again, deceptive Islamic prophecy. But Obama's actions are extremely significant to this, which really reveals how he's, he, how he's um, showing his colors as, as a Mahdi. And you know what? Uh, Al-Qaeda, I mean, uh, not Al-Qaeda, Taliban is very happy about all of this, of course, because they understand this prophecy. They understand how huge this is that was done. And so they say here, June 1st, this is from ReaganCoalition.com, Taliban welcomes victory after U.S. exchange. Taliban leader issues a rare public statement congratulating Islamists over U.S. terrorist release. Afghan government livid over the swap. Afghan Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar, he said, quote, I extend my heartfelt congratulations to the entire Afghan Muslim nations. Omar said in a video clip, and he also um, called it a big victory. Islam wins in this. It's a big victory because it has to do with the Khorasan prophecy, and it, it's a huge thing to release these guys, and it's all thanks to Obama. Do you see how huge this is, what's going on? It's so much deeper than meets the eye. And so we see his loyalty, Obama showing his loyalty over and over again. And he will continue to play politics and, and try not to be so overt about what he's doing. But we can see clearly, for anyone that has eyes to see, his true agenda. And that includes uh, creating a, a police state here in the U.S. as well. And that brings us to the other news about what's happening in the U.S. And because of Obama. Pentagon Directive outlines Obama plan to use military against U.S. citizens inside the country. Remember, he's the, he's the guy that, who can make war with him? Who can make war with him? It knows no bounds. It's everywhere, internationally here as well. Uh, uh, June 2nd, here from L.A. Times, Holder announces task force on homegrown, quote-unquote, terrorists. Okay, they flip everything upside down. We see they're supporting actual terrorists, but who will they label as terrorists here that are that are homegrown? Okay, and and in the article it talks about um, you know those that are radicalized through the internet, and so there's just there's just more surveillance. Um, Christians will be labeled like terrorists. They're already looking out for that. Uh, you know, as as we've shared before in Department of Homeland Security documents, okay? So this is all really serious events that are going on um, with Obama. Really, all the arrows, all the breadcrumbs go back to Obama and his actions in this. And so, um, just switching gears a little bit, just on this one article here about the Pope, which we, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen about the Pope. We've talked about him and his whole interfaith agenda and how Islam is really behind all of that. But, um, you know, he did big moves that we're, we're not surprised, right, given the things that um, he's been doing. But this is unprecedented what happened, as uh, reported by Reuters.com, June 8th. Pope says Israelis, Palestinians must seek peace, quote, undaunted in dialogue. Pope Francis said Israeli and Palestinian leaders, they must respond to their people's yearning for peace undaunted in dialogue during an unprecedented prayer meeting among Jews, Christians, and Muslims at the Vatican. The first such interreligious event in the Vatican. The Vatican says it's not meddling in regional issues and does not want to get involved in the details of negotiations. That's because he's leaving that to Obama. He doesn't want to get involved in the ne details. But the fact that Francis's bold move has managed to bring together the two presidents, talking about uh, Perez and Abbas, to bring the two presidents at all shows his desire to engage political leaders, offering interreligious dialogue as a building block. Okay. Yes, and we've talked about that specifically in, in other videos as well. And so this is just more of him doing that. He's going to continue to do that. We're going to see more of this as well with the whole interfaith thing, that whole deception. Islam is behind all of this. It's behind the interfaith. It's behind what Obama's doing. That's because um, it, it is so important prophetically. And we see that, you know, as we mentioned, that the, the Christians will, will be persecuted by the hands of of Islam, through Islam, and that is through the Antichrist. 
So um, in, in the midst of all of this, uh, what, what, what is important to share and to know and to keep our focus on is not, you know, all the types of deceptions. There's deceptions that we have to be aware of them. We've got to expose it. It's important. But not continually focusing on that. We've got to turn and look, what can we do in this time? How can my walk be closer with the Lord in this time? We have to be doing that, not just professing it. You know, James 1, says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Right? So we're actually doing and, and, and keeping our focus on what we're doing in these times. And a lot of times if we get caught up in, in fear or just constantly having our attention somewhere else, then we are not focusing on what we need to be doing in these times, which is really important. In the words of Yeshua himself, Jesus himself, in Matthew 7, 24 through 25, he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Hallelujah, founded upon a rock. No matter what comes, we, we, don't, we don't have to be swayed. There's a lot of stuff happening around, but we don't have to be swayed when our foundation is built upon a, a rock, a rock-solid foundation. And so we have to continue to remember to do good in the midst of challenges. There's going to be challenges. There's no doubt. I mean, we talk about, we see the, the persecution of Christians coming and here already. And all of these, there's going to be all kinds of challenges. We see it on, on, on many levels. But continuing to do right in, in God's eyes is so important to, to just make sure that we're focusing on. And it helps us to grow. It helps us through the various trials and temptations and things that we go through to be able to, to grow in the Lord. It's a great opportunity. It's a great catalyst in the midst of difficult times to grow closer to the Lord. And that's what we want to do because one of two things. Either you're going to go farther apart from the Lord when you face difficulty or you're going to grow closer. And James 1, 2 through 5 states it beautifully. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him hallelujah Hallelujah, it will help us grow in patience. And an important line there that we may forget, which seems so obvious, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. How many times do we forget to do that very important thing and try to, to figure it out on our own? And then only when it becomes very intense and critical, we may ask God for help. But why not always, when we're lacking wisdom throughout our everyday life, be asking God, what should I do next? How should I do this? And move forward. That's what, that's what we can do. And we all lack wisdom. It says, if you lack wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, we all lack wisdom because we're not perfect yet. And so, so this is very important instruction. Simply, you know, asking the Lord what to do. And He'll help us to be doers of the Word so that we know that we're doing what we need to be doing in these times. And, and He'll give us the strength to do it. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Love you all so much. Shalom.
Welcome to Martis Ministry. This is a Prophecy in the News update. We're covering some information about what's going on in the Middle East and world events and how that relates to biblical prophecy of the rise of the Antichrist and how that is fulfilled through Islam and Barack Hussein Obama and his engineering of Islamic prophecy. And if we go into the scriptures in the book of Daniel to find out some context for what's going on prophetically, we do actually see that Islam is the fulfillment of these prophecies. In Daniel 11.39, it says, talking about the Antichrist, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Now, talking about the, the first part of this verse here, we see that it says, He shall do in the most strongholds with a strange God. Well, the jihads in Syria and Libya, the jihadists and ISIS that's trained in Jordan by the CIA and all these operations that have been going on throughout the Middle East and the region, and all their covert ops and jackal armies and everything that's been going on, well, these are all Islamists, and they're following a strange God to those who are the people of God, and that strange God is the God of Islam. It is Allah, and these forces that are used are these Islamist armies throughout the world. Well, this article out of WND uh, August 13, 2014 says, CIA expert Obama Osama share Mideast goal. Washington, Claire Lopez looks more like the prototypical all-American mother she is than the highly trained government CIA operative she was for 20 years. According to the former CIA operative, President Obama's plan for the Middle East is just what Osama bin Laden wanted, removing U.S. troops and putting the jihadis in power. Quote, the administration's plan, I believe, is to remove American power and influence, including military forces from Islamic lands, end of quote, Lopez asserted. It goes on to say, quote, because that is what Islam demands, that foreign forces be kicked out of Islamic lands. Well, the article goes on to say, does Obama think if we leave the Mideast that the jihadis will then leave us alone? Quote, I don't know, end of quote, she said. Quote, I can just see the pattern that is enabling the rise of Islam, end of quote. And that is right. Obama has been helping support the jihadis. He's been releasing Taliban prisoners. He's been helping other uh, Islamic agendas throughout the world. And he's made declarations that there's a new beginning between the West and the Muslim world. And that goes on to the next part of the verse. If you look in Daniel 11.39, you'll also see where it says, Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. This part of the verse is referring to the enabling of the rise of Islam mentioned previously and also acknowledging this strange God which Obama did while meeting with an Imam. April 27, 2014, Imam to Obama, quote, end oppression of Muslims, end of quote. Obama to Imam, quote, pray for me, end of quote. The 70-year-old cleric said Obama had frequently replied with insya Allah, melee for Allah willing. And that is out of cnsnews.com. That's very specific because that's the God of Islam whom he is in acknowledging and increasing with glory through the rise of Islam. And the verse further goes on in Daniel 11.39 to say, and shall divide the land for gain. This is what the two-state solution is in the land of Israel, is dividing the land of Israel for gain, for the gain of Islam and, and for the agenda of the New World Order. And that's what Obama is the mediator for. August 6, 2014, WallStreetJournal.com reports, Obama says U.S. to back Mideast truce talks, August 6, 2014. Quote, they've shown themselves to be responsible. They have recognized Israel. They have moved forward to arrive at a two-state solution, end of quote, said Obama about the Palestinian Authority. Well, the Bible also goes on in Daniel 11, uh, 39 to talk about, He shall cause them to rule over many. And this is specific to the caliphate agenda through the OIC. Now, don't be deceived. The ISIS group is the jackal armies being used for the agenda, but they are not the final caliphate. The caliphate will be formed through the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is working with the United Nations to reform the Security Council. Those are 57 Islamic states united for the same goal for an Islamic caliphate that will be dominant worldwide. Alan West, um, out of the Yahoo.com, reports here, August 14, Alan West declares Obama an Islamist. 
Former Florida Representative Alan West declared President Obama an Islamist who is intentionally working against the security of the United States. Quote, the only plausible explanation for many actions taken by President Obama and his administration is that they are working counter to the security of the United States of America, end of quote. The former Florida congressman and retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel wrote in the Post published Wednesday, quote, the pivot away from the Mideast seems to be nothing more than an opportunity to enable Islamists and their goals, end of quote, he said. And this is very serious, and as we, as we mentioned earlier about the Islamic prophecy being engineered, there is an Islamic prophecy about Khorasan, and that is being engineered through the hand of Obama. And as we read these articles here, it should become very apparent. NewYorkTimes.com reports, U.S. troops to leave Afghanistan by the end of 2016, May 27, 2014. Washington, President Obama declaring that it is, quote, time to turn the page on a decade in which so much of our foreign policy was focused on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, end of quote, announced on Tuesday that he planned to withdraw the last American troops from Afghanistan by the end of 2016 under a new timetable outlined by Mr. Obama in the Rose Garden. The 32,000 American troops now in Afghanistan would be reduced to 9,800 after this year. And so the pulling out of the troops out of Afghanistan is exactly what happened in Iraq. But what is very dangerous about what's going on in Afghanistan and how that helps to engineer the Islamic prophecy of Khorasan is who's going to fill that void in Afghanistan once the American troops pull out. Obama to cut troops says Afghanistan, quote, will not be a perfect place, end of quote, May 27, 2014. We will bring America's longest war to a responsible end, Obama said in the White House Rose Garden in detailing the strategy to have virtually all U.S. forces out of Afghanistan by the end of 2016, shortly before his presidency ends, reports CNN.com. It's very important to understand that when these troops are pulled out, that it's these jihadi Islamists of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda who will fill that gap. And this is absolutely important to Obama, because this will help engineer Islamic prophecy of Khorasan as we go into this, it should become more clear. Obama frees Al-Qaeda, not just Taliban, from Gitmo, July 22, 2014. As Al-Qaeda threatens to blow up U.S. planes and the U.S. Open in New York, the president is cutting loose hardcore Al-Qaeda terrorists from Gitmo through a secretive parole board. And that was reported out of Investors.com. So we see more jihadis and, and, and Gitmo prisoners and, and terrorists being released by Obama, part of amnesty and working with releasing of these high-profile terrorists. This article out of New York Post reports, we're training the Taliban to kill us and take back Afghanistan, August 9, 2014. The assassination of an American general by a Taliban terrorist posing as an Afghan soldier exposes the lunacy of the administration's Afghanistan strategy. Under the pressure from President Obama, the military rushed to recruit local Afghans to stand up a national army and police ahead of his hasty year-end troop withdrawal to process some 7,000 new recruits each month. Corners were cut on background checks, allowing insurgents and terrorists to fill the ranks of the now 350,000 member security force. At the same time, the Pentagon allowed the Afghan government to take over and empty U.S. prisons of prisons of Taliban and other terrorists as part of a mass amnesty program. It also funded a terrorist, quote, reintegration, end of quote, program that pays Taliban fighters to surrender and join the government. More shocking, the two programs feed a recruiting pipeline for Afghan security forces whom U.S. troops are training to take over for them, further endangering them to insider attacks and in jeopardizing our mission there. U.S. military intelligence now fear as much as 25 
percent of Afghan security forces are Taliban or Al Qaeda operatives and, and sympathizers, which means we may be arming and training an army of some 87,500 enemy infiltrators with easy access to U.S. personnel and intelligence. The massive infiltration puts the entire Afghan exit strategy at risk. The compromised Afghan National Security Forces takes over the country security on January 1st, 2015. And that's out of the New York Post. This all relates to the Khorasan prophecy. In the map you see here of Khorasan, you see it is majority of the region of Afghanistan. And this is specific because all this Islamic um, empowering that's going on inside of Afghanistan, the training, the Taliban being released back into this um, equation here is actually going to be what you see here of the black flags being raised by the local tribesmen of the Afghanistan Taliban and Al-Qaeda who do take over when the, the United States troops pull out of Afghanistan. The region of Afghanistan, as you see here on this map, is the area of Khorasan. And this relates directly to Islamic prophecy about the black flags coming out of Khorasan. The Islamists and the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, all those who gain power after the U.S. military leaves and they actually take over will help engineer and fulfill the Islamic prophecy of this Khorasan prophecy. DailyHadith.AdaptiveSolutionsInc.com reports about the Hadith explanation. Black flags from Khorasan are Mahdi's and according to the Islamic prophecy, that there will be black flags raised from this Afghanistan region and they will be a sign that the Mahdi is with them. It actually is being engineered through the political policy of what Barack Hussein Obama is engineering in Afghanistan to prepare the way for these black flags in Afghanistan or Khorasan to be revealed. And their writings, they say, the messenger of Allah said, quote, when you see that black flags have appeared from Khorasan, then join them because Allah's Khalifa Mahdi will be among them." End of quote. The, the article goes on to say, "...the fact that none will be able to stop the advance of the bearers of black flags is the hadith narrated from Abu Harira in Marfu form. Quote, when black flags emerge from the east, nothing will be able to stop them till they are planted in Elia, Beit al-Makdis, or Jerusalem." Their goal is to actually take the black flags and all the Islamists in the region and jihad Jerusalem. And in the scripture and the prophecy of Daniel 11, you also see about these Islamic armies mentioned. Daniel 11:38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. This is actually talking about the Islamic armies and their God, Allah, who is the God of these armies, making him the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not, because the ancients of old of Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, they did not know the God of Allah. They did not know the God of Islam. They did not know this because it was a strange God to them. It's a foreign God. It's a new God that was introduced by Muhammad in 600 AD. Once these Islamic armies have united and band together for their common stated goal of taking Jerusalem, Beit El Makdis in their prophecy, you'll see that in Daniel 11.45 where it talks about him planting his tabernacles between the, the seas and the glorious holy mountain. These seas are the Dead Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, where Jerusalem lies right between, and that the, the Temple Mount is their goal to take, and that's the glorious holy mountain. Well, once they begin building the third temple in Israel, this will ignite a global jihad against Jerusalem. And in Daniel 11.31 you see this. It says, An arm shall stand on his part. These are armies that will stand on his part. And the Bible verse goes, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. This is talking about armies standing on his part, and going into Jerusalem, and jihading this temple, and stopping the sacrifice. 
This is confirmed in Matthew 24, 15 and verse 16, where it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. This is a parallel verse of Luke 21, 20, verse 21 and 22, and you see, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation is thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now there are many people that say that this verse uh, right here in Luke 21, 20 has been fulfilled in 70 AD. But this is not correct. Because you look at verse 22 and it says that all things which are written may be fulfilled in these days. And not all things have been fulfilled in the scripture knowing that this is at the end when all things are fulfilled. So this is an end times prophecy about the Islamists, the jihadists, jihading Jerusalem, surrounding Jerusalem, and taking the Temple Mount for their caliphate capital. This is what is spoken about the beast, the, the Mahdi of Islam, the Antichrist, turning against the whore and hating the whore. In Revelation 17, verse 16, we see, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And this is when, they, this is when the Muslims jihad Jerusalem. This is very clear. And for those who do not understand that Jerusalem is the whore, look what it says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. And Ezekiel talks about Jerusalem being the woman, the whore, the great harlot. Ezekiel 16, 34 through 35. And the contrary is in thee, 